Flying the Flag by Alex Shearer, starring Dinsdale Landon as Her Majesty's Ambassador, Mr. Mackenzie, with Peter Aker and Moy Leslie, and featuring Christopher Benjamin as Colonel Sorikoff. The Bread and Butter. Why can't they go to Benidorm, William, and lie on their towels or whatever they do? Hmm? I don't know, sir. Well, maybe it's full up. <laughs> well, better still stay at home. What on earth brings them here? There's no sun, no fun, no discos. Oh, curiosity about foreign parts, I suppose, sir. You know, the lure of the exotic. Yes, well, six nights in the Cherish Hotel may be an exotic experience in some ways, but it hardly puts you in the Marco Polo League. Well, I suppose, too, sir, that this new openness and reform policy has stimulated quite a lot of interest in the West. Mm, openness and reform is all well and good, William, but from a consular point of view, I'm starting to think that Cold War and xenophobia may well have been the good old days. It's not that I'm a snob, William. Oh, but but these package holidays, I regret to say, are simply bringing the wrong sort. Totally oblivious to the finer points. With no idea. I mean, how to behave. Ah, uh, William. Uh, yes, sir? Just glance out of the window. There. Do you see? Down in the square is a living example of what I'm talking about. One of the Here We Go Brigade in a furry hat with Kiss Me Comrade on it, lighting his cigarette from the eternal flame. Where do they get it from, William? Oh, they are British subjects, sir. We do have to look after them. Yes, but this country to work isn't really our province. And we should be concerned with the parian thrust of international politics. Not whether some intoxicated tourist has dropped his passport down the hotel lavatory. Yes, sir. Usually closely followed by his traveller's checks and his air tickets for afters. <laughs> I don't know what happens to people abroad, William. They seem to succumb to some strange urge to fling all their possessions away. In fact, I sometimes think that going on holiday is a species of temporary insanity. Yes, sir. The gentle art of tourism, eh, sir? All life is there. <laughs> mm, I dare say it is. But when I come in and see half of it queuing around the block, wanting us to give it 50 quid so he can get back home, I wish all life were somewhere else. Well, it could only do good in the long run, though, sir. I mean, people are getting to know what other countries are all about and seeing that communists and capitalists both really only want the same thing. What? Oh, yes, money. Well, peace, I was actually going to say, sir. Oh. No, I, I think tourism will do a lot for peaceful coexistence in the long run, sir. Uh, do you think so? Oh, you know that hooligan who was lighting his cigarette at the eternal flame a moment ago? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. well, irate passed-by has just punched him on the nose. Oh. Mm, he'll probably be here in a second, demanding we declare war and mobilise the army. Well, well, I'd better go and limber up then, sir. Well, many waiting down there this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, four or five, I think. Well, do impress upon them, William, as they recount their tales of woe, that we are not in the nappy-changing business, the money-lending business, nor are we a branch of Thomas Cook's the travel agent. The least we can do for them is the most they can expect. Yes, sir. Well, other than that, be as helpful as you can. We don't want them going home and moaning to their MPs that the British Embassy would not help them in their hour of need. No, sir. I mean, after all, at the end of the day, I mean, we're their servants, really, aren't we, sir? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they're our, our bread and butter. Mm, yes, but it would be pleasant just occasionally to get a little jam on it. Well, I, I'm sorry about your nose, too, Mr. Harris. Not as sorry as I am. If he'd still been around when I got me bearings, I'd have chinned him. Do you think that venturing abroad, Mr. Harris, with a view towards chinning the local inhabitants is really the genuine spirit in which to travel? They started it. I was only having a smoke. Yes, but lighting your cigarette from the eternal flame on the tomb of the unknown soldier, Mr. Harris. Not exactly the height of tact, is it? If I'd have had some money, I'd have bought some matches. I only wanted a light. Didn't come here to get me face punched in, did I? Well, why did you come here exactly, Mr. Harris? Well, I thought it was going to be like Yugoslavia. You know, the old birds, booze, Uno Paloma blankets and that. Right. Now, did you make a note of the numbers on the travellers' checks? Oh, I never had no travellers' checks. You didn't bring travellers' checks? I don't believe in them. Paying commission, both ends and that, right rip-off, innit? Cash is handier. Yes, and so much easier to lose, of course. Now, nah, see, I bought some reddies in, stuffed down my sock like, changed them on the black market. Yeah, yeah, well, I think the less I know about that, the better, Mr Harris, I think. So I spent some had about 100 left, and some light-fingered commie must have pocketed the lot, I reckon. A moment ago you said you lost it, Mr Harris. Now you say it was stolen. Well, I don't know. I suppose it could have been either. But it's gone anyway, and I'm flying back this evening, you see. What if you're flying back this evening? You won't need any money. Yeah, but I've got a few, like, uh... 
outstanding items at the hotel. You know, the old beer ski, odd bottle of vodka, drinks all round a chove, all that. Uh, very well, Mr Harris, I can probably authorise a loan, and I do stress a loan, of, say, uh, £50. Oh, hmm. I should just about cover it, yeah. Well, though, I'll have to impound your passport, I'm afraid. I do what? How am I going to get home without my passport? No, Mr Harris, I just stamp it, impounded. When you return to the UK, the Customs and Immigration will retain it there and return it to you once the £50 is repaid. Oh, well... Well, in that case, you couldn't make it 100, could you? 100? Yeah, another 50 for spenders. <sighs> Mr Harris, the consular facilities of the British Embassy are for emergencies only, not for handing out spenders. Yeah, but I haven't got any souvenirs or me prezies. Well, I'm sorry, Mr Harris, £50 is the limit. Oh, well, I'll have to think of something. Right, you have your passport? Yeah, it's uh, here. Didn't want to lose that as well after me money, guys, so I stuck it down me pants for safekeeping. Just put it on the desk, would you? I won't keep you a second. Sure. Here, before you disappear, pal, haven't got a light, have you? Helen. Hello, Helen? Helen, what are you doing under the desk? Impersonating a vacuum cleaner. What do you think I'm doing under the desk? Well, I don't know. If I knew, I wouldn't be asking, would I? Have you got cramp? I'm looking for a paper clip. Well, just leave it. Use another one. I haven't got another one. Move your feet. You've only got one paper clip. I've only had one paper clip for months. Why don't you requisition some? Because I haven't got any stationary requisitions. Well, then why don't you requisition some of those? Because I don't have any requisition requisitions. Do we have to requisition requisitions? In this place, Willie, you have to requisition everything. Well, if you haven't got any requisition requisitions, why don't you just type a requisition out and send that in? Well, that's precisely what I was doing when I lost my paper clip. It's not in your turn up, is it? It's hardly. I've only just walked in here. Hey, mind. Ah, uh, Helen. Oh, Helen. Are you kneeling on the floor with your hands round William's ankle for any particular reason? I'm um, just looking for something, sir. Oh, I thought maybe you were threatening to quit the job, William, and Helen was trying to persuade you otherwise, or threatening to stay with the same effect. Oh, it's not there anyway. Something I can do, sir? Yes, my appointment with the Italian ambassador. When is it? 11.15, sir. Oh, got it. Anything else, sir? Oh, yes. Could you possibly let me have a paper clip? <sighs> yes, sir. You'd better have this one. Yes, I seem to be getting a little low, Helen. Had me better requisition some. Yes, sir. Well, carry on. Oh, just get my briefcase and papers. I, I hope what you're looking for turns up. Did you want something? Yes, have you got the passport impounded stamp? Um, oh, there. Someone else lost their money. Ah, uh, yeah, and the Anatole man on his club anyone holidays. Another 50 quid. I don't know why everyone's so ratty this morning. Well, I'm sorry if I was ratty, William. I mean, if anyone's got grounds to be peeved, it's me. I get all the broom and shovel work run up in the middle of the night by the state police because they've got some British tourists fighting the furniture in the hotel bar. It's old muggings gets them all. I'm too easy going. I'm too soft. That's my trouble. A heart like a sponge, Willie. And a head to go with it. Well, we ought to be a bit harder on these tourists, like some of the other embassies. I mean, the French will only help those of their citizens who are unable to crawl. Well, the British Diplomatic Service will never need their help then, Willie. The amount of crawling that goes on here. Yeah, well, I'm not one of the forelock tuggers. I never said you were. <laughs> I'll see you both later, then. Bye. Oh, it's all right, sir. Have a good meeting, sir. Bye, sir. Might I go, sir? Don't tug your forelock too hard, Willie. Your head might come off. Uh, right, we'd better get on then. Can't keep the public waiting down there too long. You might beat the desk up. Oh, Helen, you haven't got a paper clip, have you? Ah! Oh, sorry, no, sorry, sorry, I forgot. Uh, hello, Helen. Good afternoon, sir. Meeting went well, good lunch. Mm, caviar again, Helen. Oh, dear. Not champagne as well, sir. Great, sir. Would you like one of your pills? Oh, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, any messages? A few. Um... One from the UK, from a domestic appliance manufacturer. Can we let him know who he has to bribe in order to enter the local market? And Colonel Surikov from the Commissariat rang. I gave him an appointment for 3.30. Oh, I, I, I'd better go and clear my desk in that case. Yes, and don't forget to hide your whiskey, sir. Yeah, thank you, Helen. <clears throat> I take it you have some work to do. Yes, sir. Colonel Surikov, do come in. Mr. Ambassador, I am so underwhelmed to see you. And I to see you, Colonel. 
Please allow me to convey my government's heartiest suspicions and the warmest indifference. You do me an honour, Colonel. Not at all. And may I reciprocate by transmitting my own government's enduring nervousness of your internal policies, hostility towards your foreign ones, and a general lukewarm attitude towards communism as a whole. Oh, come, Mr. Ambassador, you're too kind. <laughs> I grow weary of these compliments. Oh, I assure you, Colonel, the low boredom threshold is entirely mine. Take a seat. <laughs> So, uh, you have a pleasant lunch with the Italian ambassador. Mm, as usual, you seem to know everything, Colonel. I keep my ear to the grindstone. And very well it looks on it too, Colonel, though I shan't inquire in that event what you do with your nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is more than a social call today, Mr. Ambassador. Delightful as it is for me to come here and wag my chin. I am here for other reasons. I regret to say... I bring grim news and sad tidings. Bad news, Colonel? Yes. In fact, I think perhaps it would be well for us to have a whiskey to mitigate any possible distress. Oh, a whiskey? As a precautionary measure. Yes, well, I don't know if I actually have. I mean, at the moment, I, I... But isn't that a bottle up there in the chandelier? Is it? Oh, yes, so it is. I must have uh, casually thrown it up there in an absent moment. Uh, in the glasses, I think, uh, under your hat on the desk. <laughs> so they are. <laughs> I will talk while you pour. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, I am afraid I have to notify you that one of your fellow countrymen has, alas, passed away, Mr. Ambassador. Passed away, Colonel? But here? When did this happen? Not two hours ago in the tourist hotel. He would seem to have had a heart attack in the lobby while standing waiting for the lift. Oh. I regret nothing could be done to revive him, though I assure you we tried everything. The ambulance was called, and two men ran from the hospital with a stretcher as fast as they could, but all to no avail. Oh, dear, that is bad news. Yes, yes, the trouble, the paperwork, the next of kin. Where is the body, Colonel? It is reposing at the moment, Mr. Ambassador, at the People's Republic Dead Body Factory Number 16. Ah. You will find him there with his personal effects, of which there are few. He did not seem dressed for the climate, Mr. Ambassador, which may have contributed to his condition. Well, I know you deem ten layers of underwear to be essential, even in midsummer, but we British take a more robust view of the matter. His views may have been robust, Mr. Ambassador, but had his underwear been robuster, he may not be lying where he is today. I am sorry to be the bringer of such bad news. But obviously we in no way attach any blame to you, Colonel. Thank you. It makes a refreshing change. I'll send someone over to take care of the details. Good. I trust this unfortunate incident will not receive too much adverse publicity, nor cast a shadow over our sibling tourist industry. <laughs> Perhaps you could make it clear that his death was in no way associated with the hotel meals. Insofar as that is accurate, Colonel. Yes, of course. Ah, life is short, Mr. Ambassador. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. As your poet says, ask not for whom the bells toll. They are ringing for me and my gal. Yes, well, almost, Colonel. Almost is as good as a feast. Or as our national poet says... I am a mayfly, my life is an hour. When I lie down and don't get up again, it's something worse than the cold. It's very moving, Colonel. <laughs> yes, yes. When you have to go, you have to go. Do you have to go, Colonel? I could stay for another whiskey. What, a, a stiff, sir? No, William, not a stiff. I am instructing you to deal tactfully and discreetly with the sad and unexpected demise of a British subject, not to gum you on down the morgue and check out the stiffs. Uh, no, sir. Sorry, sir. Upper lips are stiff, William. Corpses are deceased. The Raymond Chandler approach to diplomacy is not one I favour. No, sir. Sorry. Uh, just a joke, really. Yes, well, let us not forget, William, that someone somewhere in the UK is expecting home a relative who is not going to arrive, and it is our duty to inform them of this tragic loss as sympathetically as possible and return the deceased to them with as much dignity and expedition as we can muster. Though I don't deny for the moment that the paperwork is horrendous. Yes, I was afraid it might be. The complexity is labyrinthine, and the one thing you can expect for all your trouble... Is no thanks for it. Uh, it's very good of you to give me the opportunity to acquire this experience. No, oh, it'll be invaluable, William. This may be the first time, but it won't be the last. You'd better study the procedure manual. If you get into any difficulties, come and see me. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you don't think in view of the problems a pair of more experienced... No, not really, William. You'll find everything down there. 
Colonel Sulikov has told them to expect you. Yes, sir. I'll get down there now. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, sir? Uh, yes, William? Sorry to bother you, sir. Oh, not at all. You were rather a long time, weren't you? Uh, yes, I was. You had into difficulties, did you, William? Thought you might get out of your depth of fraction, in a little over your head? Yes, yes. Nothing to be ashamed of. We all need a little expert advice from time to time. A guiding hand to point us in the right direction. Uh, take a seat, will you? And we'll go through the forms. So what problems have you run into? Mm? Well, it's not that I've run into difficulties exactly, sir. Oh, you haven't? Uh, oh, beginner's luck, eh? At least not with the paperwork. I mean, I haven't even started that. Well, you really ought to be making some kind of inroads. No, you see, I've just come from the morgue. Uh, the, sorry, the mortuary, sir. And mm-hmm. the thing is, I, I don't think he's British. But the body? Not British? No, sir. But of course he's British, William. Colonel Surikoff assured me no, that I he... think Colonel Surikoff hasn't even told us a quarter of the full story, sir. Never mind a half of it. There are no papers. Uh, there's no means of identification on the body whatsoever. Nothing at all. Well, I can't find any record of him either. I've talked to all the British tour operators. None of them admits to having lost a client. Well, not that they would if they had. Tour operators seem to hold their clients in the same regard as battery farmers do their chickens. Yes, but most package tourists have to share a room. And no one's lost a roommate. Uh, there's no record of anyone not claiming their key. You checked through the passports kept at reception? What, the ones where you must on no account surrender? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, sir, I've been through them all. But, but I mean, none of the pictures look anything like him. Mind you, none of them look much like anyone. <laughs> so, so I thought possibly you know, he could have got here under his own steam. Well, possibly, but they do keep pretty close tabs on individual travellers. Yeah, I mean, facially, he doesn't look British. I mean, not just facially. In what other words? Well, it just seems too well off. You know what most British tourists are like, so they look like they were thrown off the plane with a luggage. Yes, yeah. <laughs> got on with the meals. I mean, this chap, he's wearing a Rolex oyster watch, a gold bracelet, gold pen, I and mean, he hasn't stinted himself on a gold medallion. Wedding ring? Yes, but no sounds of lamentation and sorrow burning down the hotel corridors asking, where's my hubby? I mean, frankly, sir, I think Surikov's got the embarrassment of a body in the tourist hotel, and instead of taking responsibility for it himself and finding out whose it is, he just tries to fob it off on us. Well, in that case, we shall have to fob it back, will you? Though I, I did think, sir, that he might possibly be an American. What made you think that, William? Well, his socks, sir. Oh, different colours, were they? No, sir. It's worse than that. Not accept responsibility, Mr. Ambassador? Well, I'm afraid not, Colonel. For one of your own people? Mm, there seems little, if any, evidence, Colonel, that the deceased is one of our own people. And I cannot accept responsibility until I have proof that he was. <laughs> so, this is the famous British welfare state in action. From the grave to the cradle, I believe, was once the expression. But now, the individual is not only responsible for educating himself, performing medical operations upon himself, and paying himself a wage when he does not have a job, he is also responsible for getting himself home when he is dead and for making arrangements to bury himself. Colonel, this kind of incident occurring in your hotels I would deem to be your responsibility. This is, may I remind you, the British Embassy, not some sort of lost property office where you hand in bodies and we keep them for three months until someone claims them. And I'd hardly describe your conduct as cricket. From what I have seen of cricket, I will take that as a compliment. And as for your own uncooperative attitude, well, it's not exactly a water polo. And the man is probably one of your own people, Colonel. Oh, impossible. Only foreign visitors with appropriate passes are allowed into the tourist hotels. Staff accept. Well, I cannot accept responsibility for the deceased, Colonel, until there is incontrovertible evidence that he is a British subject. Mm. You couldn't, uh, as a small favour... Take him off her hands? Mm, not even as a microscopic favour, I regret, Colonel. The paperwork, Mr. Ambassador, is horrendous. The complexity... Never in time, Colonel. The duplicate forms have to be filled out in triplicate? I can sympathise, Colonel, but that's all I can do. I suggest you try the American embassy. Yes, perhaps if I approach Ambassador Weinberg. So, so shall we have... I a... think you'll find Ambassador Weinberg has a bottle of bourbon, actually, Colonel. Indeed? Oh, well, in that case, I will not detain you further. Good day. I merely suggested that Colonel Surikov make inquiries in your direction, Spire. I did not send him round to see you. Well, I personally resent you trying to make me responsible for dealing with this poor guy and putting ideas into Surikov's head about coming round drinking my best Jack Daniels. 
Trying to hang your dirty washing on my line like that, Mac? Well, it's not what I call baseball. No, Spider. I mean, look, let me factualize you for a second here and do a little statisticalization. I beg your what? Do you know how many Americans die abroad worldwide in the course of an average year? No, but I'm in the I'm region of five to six thousand, mm. Mac. Mm. Five to six thousand. Yeah, yeah. They've all got to be flown home. The next the kid notified by the paperwork yeah, alone. It's horrendous, Spider. Yeah. Mm. The complexity. They're very complex. I got a big workload, Mac. I got three guys like this one at the morgue lying on my desk already. But this guy's got no ID, Mac. You got no ID. You're a non-person. Even dead, you don't exist. There's nothing at all to indicate the poor guy was an American citizen. That is ample evidence, Spider. Look it. He didn't have a crew cut. He wasn't wearing a vote Republican badge. He was wearing Farrah slacks. Oh, Farrah slacks are internationally retail outleted. A button-down collar. Proof nothing. His cigarette case was full of American cigarettes. A brand of butts available all over, Mac. And he was wearing white socks. But that, I believe, is what you would call the clincher. White socks? White socks? So what does that show? That he'd been to the laundry? Oh. Why should that make him an American? With brown shoes. Something wrong with white socks and brown shoes? It was not that long ago, Spino, that the affectation of brown shoes was regarded as the hallmark of a cad. And the affectation of white socks with them was probably indicative of insanity. Oh, oh. Well, say, what century is the British diplomatic service living in these days, Mac? You still stuck in 17-something, or have you moved on to the 1800s? There are such things as standards, Spino. There's such stuff as horse feathers, Mac. Well, as far as our nameless friend in the mortuary goes, we are unable to take delivery, and the ball, so to speak, is in your court. Well, it's an incomplete pass. I told Sir Rykoff to go try the French embassy. Well, what makes you think the man was French? He was wearing an Yves Saint Laurent pullover. Oh, and he my. looked kind of debauched, Mac. Uh -oh. You know, the way the French do. Like he just crawled out of the cat house or something. Mm, well, worth a try, Spider. And if they won't have him, of course, there's always the Japanese embassy. You think he looked Japanese? I don't think his eyes were right. No, but he was carrying a Japanese camera. Oh, yeah, sure, Mac. And he looked out of condition like he had a little blubber on him. <laughs> you think maybe he's an Eskimo? Well, it's pretty appalling, really. Yeah, the unknown citizen. Was he free? Was he happy? Who cares? Let's get rid of him. Unwanted citizen, more like. Fancy being shunted round the embassies of the world like a package in a game of international pass the parcel. Hawked about door to door like clothes pegs. Uh, do people still come round with clothes pegs? Well, tumble dryers then, you know what I mean. And what about the poor man's relatives? Yeah, well, maybe he hasn't got any. We no one seems to have missed him. He's just disappeared like a piece of human small change down the back of the sofa of life. Did the house magazine ever publish those poems you sent them, Willie? No, they returned them actually. Why? No reason. Anyway, it isn't so much that he's disappeared without trace as that he's arrived without trace. Yeah, it is amazing, though. I mean, in a world where a hundred mailing lists have got your name, where someone somewhere uh, knows what teeth you have, your blood group, your credit rating, uh, your marital status, and the sight of your birthmark, we can't make a move without someone's curtains twitching. There's still people who can fall down through a crack in the system and never be seen again. Well, I don't see why we can't simply fly him back and give him a dignified burial. Well, he's not a British citizen, Ellen. I mean, you know how tight the immigration rules are. Well, I know some people go to extraordinary lengths to get into the country, William, but don't you think that dying is going a little far? Mm. Where's the buck got to now? Uh, still on the move. No sign of it stopping. Last I heard, they were trying the Nigerian embassy. But he wasn't black, was he? I don't think bothered about that, as long as someone will have him. Anyway, there are white Nigerians, actually. Uh, but it is a long shot. Well, it surely can't be the first time this sort of thing's happened. Yeah, probably not. You'd think there'd be a memorial to the unknown tourist. Yeah, with eternal flame, like on the unknown soldier out in the square. Helen? What is it, Willie? Really? I think I know who it might be. Who? The unknown soldier? No, no, no our friend in the morgue. Well, he's not exactly my friend, but any friend of yours? I, I thought there was something about him I recognised, and I didn't think of it until now. His face? His socks? Uh, no. His jacket. Well, what about it, William? Well, it's leather, sir. I mean, he's wearing a leather coat. Well, how does this help us with the process of elimination? I mean, it often appears to me, William, that there are more human beings with leather coats than there are cows with them. Well, no, no, it's not just that, sir. There's also a small cigarette burn on the cuff. Yes. Well, I've seen it before. Do you remember that um, tourist we saw lighting his fang from the eternal flame? Yes. 
Well, he came to the embassy because he'd lost all his money, and we had to lend him fifty pounds to settle his hotel bill. I trust you impounded his passport, William. Oh yes, sir. Good. But he also wanted some extra money for spenders, sir. Spenders, William. Well, you know, to buy his presents and souvenirs. Well, I sincerely hope that spenders were not forthcoming, William. It is not the function of Her Majesty's government to supply its citizens with spenders. Quite the contrary, in fact, it is the function of the citizens to give spenders to the government. Yeah, well, no, sir, I didn't give him any more than the minimum. In fact, I, I sent him away with a bit of a flea in his ear. Well, had you sent him away, William, with a whole colony of fleas in his ear, it would have been no more than he deserved. No, sir. Well, then I realised just who the dead man probably is. It's the body of our tourist friend. Oh, no, sir, it's not him. It's not Mr Harris, because he's back in the UK. Then what is all the excitement about, William? Well, I remember that Harris was wearing a leather jacket when mm-hmm. he was here, also with a cigarette burn on the cuff. Now, I remember noticing it when he signed for the money. So the jacket and the cigarette burn are identical to that on the dead man. William, what does this prove, other than that people who wear leather jackets are careless smokers? It must be the very same jacket, sir. I mean, my theory is that Harris sold the dead man his jacket to get some money just to buy souvenirs. In fact, in fact I was so certain, sir, I, I rang Harris in England. I hope you'd have the charges, William. Uh, well, anyway, I had a bit of trouble getting through to him at first, sir. Yes, he struck me as the type you'd have trouble getting through to. Anyway, but when I finally did, and assured him that you know, he wasn't any sort of trouble, uh, he admitted that that was exactly what he'd done. So who does this make the deceased, William? Well, a tout, sir. A tout? Or a member of the parallel economy, you mean? Yes, sir, you know, one of the local communist wide boys, you know, who hang about the hotel corridors going, Psst, hey, you, uh, uh, you know, changing money on the black market, asking if you want to sell a trousers you're standing up in, or... The leather jacket you're wearing. I see, but Sonicop maintains it is impossible for the locals to get into the tourist hotels unless they work there. Uh, Yes, sir. Well, or unless they happen to know a friendly member of staff or or the whereabouts of the fire escape door. I mean, no one on the staff would risk identifying him for fear they'd get into trouble themselves. Yeah. So he's probably from the provinces somewhere, sir. Uh, If you ask Surikov to get the police in the outlying areas to take a look for their mugshots, I bet they'll find him in there. Right. Well, recommend that course of action to him, William. If this is true, it will be red faces all round, and not for a change eyes. Well done. Mm. Helen? Yes, sir? Uh, Colonel Surikov, please. There they go, William. Sorry, sir? Another conger of tourists playing follow the leader across the square. Oh, yes, sir. En route to pay their respects to the unknown soldier, thence to see the exhibition of economic achievements, on to the Hall of Science, the museum, the bicycle factory, the ballet, the circus, and then off home to tell their friends they've done communism, quite oblivious to the fact that communism has done them. Yes, sir. Yes, this is package tourism, William. It only confirms what I've always suspected, that little of any value ever came out of a package. Well, with exceptions, sir. In fact, well, I went on a package holiday myself once, sir, and, well, quite enjoyed it, really. Did you, William? Well, I certainly shan't mention it if you don't. Oh, thank you, sir. On the other business, William, you handled that rather well. It was a good bit of, um... Uh, um gumshoe work, sir? Detective work <laughs> on your behalf. Well done. Thanks, Come sir. in. Sorry to disturb you, sir. Mm. Two British nationals down in reception. They've mislaid their passports and air tickets. Can we help them, please? Oh, right. I suppose we'd better. Job for you there, William. What, me, sir? But I've only just... (sighs) All right, yes, sir. I'll go down. Um, there is one other thing, actually, sir. Yes, Helen? Well, um, apparently someone's left a baby in reception, sir. A baby? A baby, Helen? Yes, sir, a baby. They've left it there in a paper bag. Well, what sort of baby? A loud baby, sir. A very loud, wet baby. Oh, good God, a baby. What are we going to do with a baby? Yes, well, a job for you there, I think, William. In The Bread and Butter, you heard Dinsdale Landon as Mr Mackenzie... Peter Aker as William Frost, Moira Leslie as Helen Waterson, Stephen Greif as the United States Ambassador, Stephen Rashbrook as Harris, and Christopher Benjamin as Colonel Surikov. Flying the Flag was written by Alex Shearer and produced by Pete Atkin. Now, here comes the music. Do I look bothered? Oh, you are awful. But I like you. (laughs) 
I got home the other night, and what did I discover? The law's been around again to see me younger brother. My sister's gone and got in trouble with her lover. I've had a blooming enough of it, with one thing and another. I should have listened to me dear old mother. She was a good old girl, gold lover. Find a wife and settle down, she'd say. But brother, you know how it is, what with one thing and another. a wash and shave and I went round for Tommy Glover to ask him if he fancied a quicken down the golden plumber. He came to the door and said, me missus might discover. You know how it is, Arthur. One thing and another. He carries a can cause he's old man ain't bothered a But let me tell you, squire, I might end up in the fire if I ever get out of this bed. I roll myself a fair and make an effort to recover. But I've lost me tin of batter and I can't afford another. Now some moggies in the yard have started fighting with each other. I've had a blooming enough of it. With one thing and another my chair. Get out of it, will you? Sorry. That was in the psychiatrist's chair. <laughs> and now... Hands up. This is a hold up. This is a hold up. Hands up. Hold up your hands. This is a stick up. Stick up your hands, this is a hold up. Give me the money. Oh, I must get that right. Give me the money. Hands up, this is a stick up. Give me the money. Hands up, this is a stick up. Give me the money. Hands up, this is a stick up. Give me the money. Oh, yes, that's it. Hands up, this is a stick up. Give me the money. Hands up, this is a stick up. Give me the money. Hands up, this is a stick up. Give me the money. That's it. Hold hands, this is an upstick. I'm with your sticks, this is a hand tool. I beg your pardon? I mean, this is a stick up. A hold stick. A hold stick? I mean, a hand stick. Oh, I um, see. You mean this is a hold up? Yes, that's right. It's a hold up, yes. Out with your hands and give me your money. How? What do you mean, how? How do I give you the money? With my hands up? Well, you put your hands up and give me the. M no, you give me the money and then put your hand. Oh, I don't know. Work it out for yourself. But give me the money. No, I don't think I will. Come on. Well, why should I? I've got a gun, stupid. Yes. Unless loaded. Yes. Unless loaded. Yes. With real bullets. And if I fire it, you'll be dead. Oh, sprue down the floor. Dead. Well, go on then. Shoot me. Do you mean that? Yes. Well, cross your heart and hope to die. Cross my heart and hope to die. Oh, it's Dom messing about. Give me the money. No. But you don't understand. I don't want to shoot you. Mm, I know that. You see, you're supposed to be terrified of my threats. I see. And I waggle the gun, mm -hmm. and you give me the money, mm. and then I run out with the bag. Of course. But if I take the wrong one, you call me back and give me the right one. Yes. All right, then, shall we do it again? Right. All right, close your eyes. I won't go all the way out. I'll just go a little way. <laughs> Out with your hands and give me your money. Ooh, what'd you press that for? 
It's the alarm bell. I know. Oh, the police will be round here any minute. Well, you'd better be quick. Oh, they'll take me away and put me in prison. Well, hurry up and go away, then. What, without the money? Yes, hurry. They'll be here any moment. No, I won't go. Get on, you idiot. I don't want you to go to prison. I know you don't. Well, go away, then. No, I'm not going. Go on. No. Go on. Won't. Go on. Shan't. No, all right, then. Take the money. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, we present The Navy Lark with our three stars, Dennis Price, John Pertwee and Leslie Phillips. <laughs> it's nice to have odd people dropping in, provided it's not a little man in a flat cap who wants to cut off a supply of something. The people who visit our island draft are not only odd, but usually drop in to drop them in it. All the nice girls love a sub-lieutenant. All the nice girls love a tar. All the nice girls love a sub-lieutenant. Because you know what sub-lieutenants are. Oh, good morning, Heather. What an absolutely marvellous day. Absolutely spiffing, sir. <laughs> yes, it is. Hey, just a minute. You're not Heather. No. I'm Judith, and I'm simply dying to meet you. Are you really? I say it's an even better day than I thought. I, I'm Sub-Lieutenant Spiffing. Uh, I, I mean, I'm... I, I'm Spiffing Lieutenant Phillips. I, I, I'm spilling left-handed nuts. Um, uh, how, how do you do? Most terribly well. Yeah, I can imagine you would. <laughs> yes. You're most terribly new here, aren't you? Yes, I am. Fancy your noticing. Oh, I'm pretty sharp at times, you know. When? Well, there was a day in 1946, I... <laughs> oh. Hmm. Uh, you're a little tinker, aren't you? Well, Daddykins always says I had a ducky sense of humour. <laughs> Daddykins was so right. Uh, where is Heather? Who? Heather, you know, the wren who's usually here. Has she been drafted? No, she was in here earlier. We met. Oh, sounds as though you met head on. Well, I'm sure she's terribly sweet, if you ever wanted to get to know her. I say, steady on. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, leave duty. I'm taking over whilst Heather goes on leave. Oh, yeah? Well, perhaps it might be a spiffing idea if Philippikins was to show you the ducky little ropes. Oh, would you worry? Oh, I'd absolutely adore that. Oh, so would I. <laughs> When you come off duty tonight, perhaps we could take a little, um, whoops, oh, Heather. <laughs> Hello, Heather. <laughs> it's Heather. I, I was just, um... Oh, that's odd. Do you think she was upset? <laughs> I'm sure I couldn't say what she is. Oh, lovely, there's number one. Oh, what a darling little buzzer. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know you'd met him. <laughs> oh, I mean... Uh, do, do, you, uh, do you think so? I, I never really thought of it quite like that. Oh, you know? well, there it goes again. Daddy kid has got one just like that. Isn't it too, too sweet? Yes, but number one won't be if I don't answer that um, sweet thing. Uh, come in. Mm. You buzzed, Daddy Kin? Uh, I mean, uh, you, you buzzed, sir? Yes, Mr. Phillips, Daddy Kin's buzzed. <laughs> what seems to have got you all of a doodah this morning? I take it you haven't copped butchers at the outer decoration in the office there, sir. <laughs> She's the most gorgeous bit of doodah we've ever had. <laughs> well, who or what is? The new wren, sir. She's just arrived and she's a cracker. Cracker? You mean she went off bang? <laughs> well, no, sir, but I did. <laughs> uh, why, why don't you go and have a look for yourself, sir? Give the old eyeballs a field day. <laughs> Certainly not, Mr. Phillips. I have no intention of snooping on new arrivals merely because they happen to be gorgeous bits of doodah. <laughs> oh, no, sir. No, sir. Of course not. Of course not. Well, however, I was just, um, yes, uh, going to make sure the door was properly closed. Uh, uh, drafts in here, you know, terribly. Uh... Was there some little thing you wanted, sir? Uh, what? Oh, no. No, no, nothing. Just shutting the door. Carry on. <laughs> what was that? Is that a faro piece of doodah, or isn't it? <laughs> yes, it, it is, Mr. Phillips, it is. Sometimes I must admit their lordships at the Admiralty do as proud. I know, sir. I know. Mm -hmm. Couldn't we Couldn't we send for her? And when she comes... Uh, come in. Uh, we were just... Uh, 
Oh, good morning, Heather. <laughs> ah, Heather, a grand uh, morning. Here's a signal, uh, sirs. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord, I don't think we're terribly, terribly popular. Yes, I had noticed. You know, sir. <laughs> mm. You know, sir. I was, um, I was thinking. <laughs> With those two girls here, sir, but, we could... Uh, well, well... Well, well sir, if... Uh, <laughs> if we, um, if we played our cards right, sir... Ah, forget it, Mr. Phillips. Now, what's this uh, signal about, eh? Uh, Ten to one, it's Moe Thunderguts. Commander Povey sends out more signals than a ship in distress. Agreed, except that it is the people who receive the signals that end up in distress, not him. Oh, I don't know, sir. We had him going once or twice. Mm, well, now it appears to be his turn. He wants to know who authorised an unauthorised flight by the helicopter from Jersey yesterday. Eh, that, that must have been one of Pertwee's relatives, delivering the duty-free wallop for the wardrobe. Yes, it must indeed. The supply arrived in the nick of time. We nearly had to buy a bottle at normal prices. That's odd. How did Povey get to hear of the flight? He's never has before, and Pertwee's relatives have been whizzing the booze over to us for years. Yes, most curious. Uh, familiarity must have led to carelessness somewhere. Before, and Pertwee's little um, arrangement has leaked out. If old Thundergus knows her, it's no leak. It's a gusher. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'd better have a word with the chief and see if we can plug it before we all have to go teetotal or bankrupt. Now, if Commander Povey phones, tell him that I'm investigating the matter. One man went to mo, went to mo. Sit still, Johnson. Went to mo, a meadow. Oh! Oh, you chopped my ear off. You should have wiggled it out of the way. <laughs> right, that'll be extra. What will? Cutting your lug hole, Johnson. <laughs> Ninepence only covers cutting your hair. Well, I didn't want my ear cut. Well, they are then. You should have wiggled it. Uh, you're rotten, you are, ear old cutter. I'll chop it. I'll chop the other one off if you don't keep still. Oh, I didn't even know you could cut hair until this morning. Neither did I, Johnson. <laughs> Neither did I. Hey? I've got news for you. I don't think I can. <laughs> Here, what have you done? Well, it's, it, it's not what I've done, Johnson. It's more... Well, it, it's more what I've, what I've overdone, see? <laughs> Here, um, does hair grow quickly in your family? <laughs> no, we're not particularly hair. Here, I want a mirror. Quick, give me a mirror. No, no, I don't think you do, Johnson. No, <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't advise it. Not for about a month. <laughs> You rotten lug old chopper, you scalp me. No, no, of course I haven't. No. No, you're not bald. You look like an advert for an heiress daughter that's just beginning to work. <laughs> what am I going to do now, then? Well, for a small consideration, I'll let you have an hat that's two sizes smaller. How much more are you going to have off? Oh, not much, Johnson, not much. The supply has sort of run out. From here on, it's really a job for sandpaper. Here. <laughs> You're not sandpaper in my bonds. All right, please yourself. But it brings it up a lovely smooth finish. All right, that's it. I want to get up. Come on, let me up. All right, certainly, Johnson, but don't move about too fast. Why not? It'll be a bit drafty, mate. <laughs> don't want you getting a cold in your head, do we? Uh, you wait. I am waiting, Johnson. For the night pence. Uh, blooming robber. Johnson. What? No tip? No. <laughs> you didn't ask me if I wanted anything on it. Something on what? The only thing you want on it is a wig. <laughs> Who is it? You can't have none. It's number one, she is. Oh, blimey. Open the door, Johnson. All oh, right, oh. That's it. Right. <laughs> Will you kick it your side, sir? It sticks. Ah, bonjour, chief. Bonjour, is it? Yes, after all that, I feel as if I'm entering the Bastille. <laughs> oh, tries you mysterical, sir, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> quiet. <laughs> you fuzzy wuzzy quiet. Uh, who's your new assistant, chief? I don't think we've met. 
new assistant to hmm, work. Yeah, there you are, you see, blooming lug old chopper. I'm unrecognisable. Then be grateful. <laughs> no, you made a mistake, sir. He's not new. It's Abel Seaman Johnson, sir. Well, it's impossible. Johnson's a much younger man. He's got hair. Uh, no, sir. Not got. Had. <laughs> oh, gracious. Oh, I've had a haircut, sir. <laughs> that is probably the understatement of the year. You look as if you're wearing a tin hat with no brim. <laughs> Feels like you know. It's as smooth as a baby's... Bounce up! <laughs> look, uh, can we, uh, can we get something for you, sir? Uh, well, Chief, it's not so much uh, what you get as what you got for us yesterday. Uh, there's, uh, there's been a leak. A leak? Mm -hmm. You mean a bottle broke, sir? No, no, Chief. I mean that uh, somehow Commander Povey appears to have learnt of your relative's um, freight line activities with one of their lordship's helicopters. Commander Povey, eh? Mm hmm. Oh, blimey, that's awkward, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The question is, how did he find out? Well, I don't know, sir. Oi, Glean Bombs. <laughs> did you say anything? No, not me. I'd forgotten he was due to fly over yesterday. I'll look into it at once. Sir. Yes, I should, Chief. Uh, I imagine the commander will be paying us a visit in the very near future in order to do just that himself. Yeah, quite, sir. And uh, it would be handy if we knew how it happened first. Uh, exactly. Uh, forewarned is forearmed, you know. Mm, I wish someone had forewarned me, <laughs> Sweeney Todd. Johnson? What? Get your flaming hair cut. What, again? Again, egghead. Oh, I'll have to get at it from the inside, then. <laughs> well, if they can't take any off the top... Get someone to take it off your middle, fatty. Uh, Chief, uh, when you've quite finished trying to get our rotund lily gilded, will you kindly concentrate on finding out how Commander Povey rumbled the duty-free wallop? Yes, it will have more immediate attention. Splendid. Otherwise, I feel we may have his. A grand morning for a haircut, isn't it? Ooh! All right, what's the matter now? Well, it wasn't half a draft when he shut that door. <laughs> Never mind that. Look, I've got to get a hold of Nunky of the Fleet Air Arm jersey and see if he's in the rattle for a little light smuggling yet already. <laughs> but, Heather, you just don't understand. I mean, honestly, we were, we were just having a chat. Huh. Oh. After all, Judith's new here, and I thought... I know what you thought, all right. Oh, Lummy, well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, was, I was just making the girl feel welcome. And vice versa, by the look of it. <laughs> With open arms and all. <laughs> Not at all. It's simply that she, she, she misses Daddykins. Daddykins? Yes, Heatherkins. I, I, mean, I mean, yes. <laughs> Mr. Phillips, strangely enough, I've no desire to discuss that. Lady, I'm sure she's going to be a very pleasant office ornament. Hello. Which one's that? It's Old Faithful, Chief. Ah, oh, hello, Heather. Look, get me fleet air on Jersey, will you? Certainly, Chief. Here, Heather. Have you seen the new bit of naval issue floating about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's a proper bit of old whoopity, she is. Line engaged. Honestly, you men are all the same. I know, it's absolutely spiffing, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, uh, I mean... Um... I'm going out. Oh, jolly good. I'll come with you. By myself for a long, long walk. Oh, well, don't overdo it, old girl. <clears throat> oh. I wish you wouldn't do that. If the hinges don't go, my eardrums will. <clears throat> hello, Philippikins. Oh, hello, Judy. <laughs> I say, you're, um, you're having a busy day, aren't you? Whatever. Number one's been showing little me around. Oh, how, how niceikins of him. Yes, Mr. Phillips, wasn't it? Oh, Lummy, I do wish you wouldn't wear those rubber-soled shoes, huh? So does Chief Petty Officer Pertwee. He reckons they're a inhumanitary invention, sir. I agree with him. I'm absolutely terribly fagged. Honestly, I'm pooped. <laughs> Perhaps you'd better have the rest of the day off. What a good idea. I'll come with you. Oh, hello, Heather. It's Heather over there. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, good gracious. I say, don't you find Heather just a tinsy, whimsy bit noisy? Yes, just lately, yes. Mm. She'll give us all blinding headaches before long. Oh, never mind. Let me wub your poor old head then. Oh, no, no, let me... No, I mean... <laughs> well, Mr. Phillips, what do you mean? I, uh, I have no idea, sir. Well, that's fair. We never know what you mean, so now it's your turn. Oh, thank you very much. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Which one is it this time? It's little me. Ah, oh, well, this is Chiefy Keynes. 
Look, get me free to hell on Jersey for Drake's sake. It's urgent. I've got to get in before somebody else does. All right, I'll push you through. <laughs> Did he? Well, I've never heard of such brazen effrontery. Right, leave this to me. Uh, you wanted something, Commander Povey? I always want something. You'll soon learn that. Uh, do you happen to know if there's an officer at Feet Air Arm Jersey who rejoices in the name of Hildebrand Pertwee? As a matter of fact, sir, yes. He gave me a lift on leave in a helicopter once. Did he really? Oh, it was all above board, sir. <clears throat> he charged me. Mm. <laughs> I'm sure he did. How much? Normal airfare. He said he wasn't trying to make a profit. Get me number one of the island draft. I'm going over there to sort one or two people out. Aye, aye, sir. No, I've got a better idea. Ring the Admiral's office and see if he could spare me a few minutes of his valuable time. The Admiral, sir? But I can't get straight through oh, to... Oh, yes, you can. I have his express permission to call him at any time. But he says that to everybody, sir. Well, I'm the one who's going to do it. Get me the Admiral. Johnson! Johnson! Yeah, blooming lug old chopper old. <laughs> Johnson! Ah, uh, you're rotten, that's what you are, you're rotten. Here, yeah, Baldy, belt up and come here. What's the matter, then? Oh, everything. Yeah. I've spoken to Nunky over at Fleet Air Arm Jersey, and he's been nobbled, all right. Somehow, our little arrangement for flying the booze for the wardroom over, at the price, of course, has been rumbled. Cool, is your Nunky in the rattle, then? Hello. Johnsy boy, Uncle Hildebrand here. You've got to help, they're bunging me in the rattle. All right, often. But... Yes, Johnson, Nunky is. What? In the rattle. Oh, what a shame. Eh? I'd much rather have been you, Burrow Chopper. Look, will you be quiet about your chop burrows? Wow. How did it happen? That's what I don't understand. How did it happen? You nicked me with the scissors. <laughs> Painful, it wasn't. I all. don't mean that. I mean, how did Nunky get rumbled? Oh, well, perhaps a dissatisfied customer put the squeak in. We don't have any dissatisfied customers. Not until we have to cough up, that is. Oh, well, you got one here for a start. Johnson. Feel like Van Gogh after a rough night, are Where's you? Where's me and scissors? <laughs> what? Where's me and scissors? Pardon. You watch it. Yes, Chief. Here. And you better warn the other uncle. Which one? I've got them spread everywhere. Well, the one that runs the furniture removal business with their three-ton truck. Oh, well, that's all right. I rang him up yesterday and told him to go careful whilst the heat's on. Oh. Hello, store's here. This is Bright Police here. Where out. Good morning. Hold it. Hold it. It's a small matter concerning... Yeah, I've got 14 witnesses to prove I was skating in Iceland at the time. <laughs> That's all right, sir. We shan't be recording them. Uh, oh, good. This time. Oh, bad. So, for another matter. Such as what? We've apprehended uh, Mr Herbert Pertwee on suspicion of using a Navy three-ton truck for private purposes. Now, have you got one missing? What, a truck or an uncle? I, I beg your pardon. Granted, I'll ring you back. Now what? Well, you know I said the heat, son. Yeah? Uncle Herbert's in the oven. <laughs> oh, dear. What's <laughs> going on, Johnson? The Pertwees have been struck down like flies. Who's swatting us? <laughs> I don't know, but... <laughs> That'll do. Remember, he who laughs, 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 laughs. Laughs. Laughs, he who laughs, laughs. Remember, he who laughs... Laughs, laughs, laughs in moderate, so shut up and get your hair cut. <laughs> oh, blimey, how short back and sides can you get? You'd be surprised, glossy bonts, now keep quiet. <laughs> I've got to work this out before any more Pertwees get knocked off. Judy, couldn't I show you round the unit? I don't think Daddykins would approve. I'm blooming certain Daddykins wouldn't. <laughs> Besides, I've got absolutely masses and masses to do. Well, can't Heather give you a hand? You're joking, of course. She's the one who keeps dishing out all the masses and masses to do. Oh, perhaps she's trying to keep you out of trouble. No, I think she's trying to keep you out of trouble. <laughs> yes, I see what you mean. Trouble's my middle name. <laughs> What's your first? Disaster. <laughs> I, I mean, uh... Leslie. Leslie? Oh, what a simply heavenly name. Well, Judith's pretty. Oh, uh, Heather. Hello. <laughs> we were just having a little, um, uh, you know, that is, uh... Oh, my ear. 
Oh, there goes number one on his darling little buzzer again. Come in. Ah, oh, Mr. Phillips, I had a feeling you'd be in the outer office. I trust my buzz didn't interrupt anything? No, I'm afraid not, sir. <laughs> oh, hello, uh, number one here. Jetty Guard here, sir. Pompey Launch sighting, sir. Good gracious. Are you sure? Positive, sir. I was just going to start gunnery practice all round it when I thought better of it. Oh, just as well, but why? Well, I think the Admiral's aboard, sir. All right, all right, I'll deal with this. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, panic station, sir? Very definitely. The Admiral seems to have decided to visit the old folks at home, and I don't know why. We shall probably jolly soon find out, sir. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of, Mr Phillips. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> Get a move on, you airless wonder. We'll never have these booze bottles hidden in time. You know, hiding these crates now is locking the stable door after the bolt was rusted, if you ask me. Well, I didn't. And I don't think you got that quite right somehow, do you? Well, that last haircut went a bit deep. I can't think straight now. You asked me it wasn't deep enough, did you? I don't know. Phantasmagorical, didn't it? Now, every time I get in touch with one of my relatives, the arm of the law stretches out and another good pert we gets done. <laughs> What's the score now, then? Two down and three quaking in the hand-stitched Morocco calf creepers. Oh, no. <laughs> you know me. It's got me beat, Johnson, I'm telling you. It's got me beat. Harsh words have been muttered in the family right now about Johnsy dropping them in it. Ah, I've muttered a few myself. Yeah, they've not passed unnoticed, mutter putty. Come on, get those crates under cover. All right. There you are, that's a lot. Good. No sense in leaving the evidence lying about whilst the Pompey launch is over here. The way things are going, old Thundergus probably knows where we've hidden the bottles already. Hardly, Johnson. I haven't rung anybody up. Did... Stone me! Of course! What? That's it! What? Every time I use the phone to give one of my relatives a short, sharp signal like Scarper, Pove ears about it. We're being tapped. Well, that's nothing new. I'm always being tapped. <laughs> Ninepence here, a tanner for a tip. No, there. no, no. Not us, you nit. The phone, the phone. Oh, oh, but Heather wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, of course she wouldn't. But we've got a spy here, all right? A spy. Now then, who can it be? Who can be a spy? I oh, know. It must be Daddykins is Judykins that dropping Chiefykins and the Muttykins. <laughs> She's a gorgeous bit. Yeah, so was Matty Hardykins. <laughs> Come on, we're going over to the office to tip number one off before he gets done rotten and all. Well, of course, we're all delighted that you're paying this visit, sir. It was so, um, so unexpected. I'm sure it was. No? What was that? What are you mumbling about, number one? I just said welcome, sir. Eh? You'll come where? I don't remember asking you to come anywhere. You didn't, actually. Acton Central? What's this idiot want to go to Acton Central for? By the time I've finished with them, they'll be happy to go anywhere. Oh, is something wrong, Commander Bobby? Nothing as far as I'm concerned, number one. At long last, I've got the lot of you just where I want you. In Acton Central? <laughs> I mean, uh, oh, lummy, that sounds a bit hot. Hot? Nonsense, it's never hot in Acton. Lovely spot. Had a picnic there in 1928, it was. And it was a lovely little filly. Dr. Rex, yes. yes, she must be about 70 now. <laughs> she was 60 then. <laughs> and looked it. Come in. Uh, Chief Petty Officer Pertwee reporting, sir. Ah, Chief, what is it? Ah, uh, well, it's urgent, sir. Could I have a quiet word with you? No, you can't. I have something to say first. Oh, that makes a nice change. Uh, but, sir, I, uh, I, I gather it'll have to wait, Chief. It'll wait about as well as a time bomb, sir. I've got to tell you Chief something. Chief Petty Officer Pertwee, will you be quiet? I'd rather not, sir, if you don't mind. Look, just a quick word. Silence! <laughs> I say, hasn't it gone quiet? <laughs> The calm before the storm, I assure you, gentlemen. What are you babbling about, Povey? A Trojan horse, sir. Uh, Mr. Phillips, ask the new ranger to come in, please. Judikins? I, I mean, I, I, sir. A pleasure, sir. Don't do it, sir. No, don't Will do it. Will you be quiet, Chief? <laughs> I shan't be a minute. 
Uh, you know, I feel it would be wiser if I did have a word with the chief. That won't be necessary, number one. Uh -huh. I'll tell you all he wants to... Right now. I've known for a long time that you were a conniving bunch of blackguards, but up to now I've never been able to prove it. However, thanks to the wren I had posted here... You had posted here? That uh... is what I said, and she has had a most enlightening time at your switchboard. I knew it! I knew it! There's a viper in our bosom, I was right! <laughs> you were, but far, far too late. Good gracious. Uh, this way, Judikins, I'd like you to meet Commander... Daddykins! Uh, Commander Daddykins. Uh, I mean, uh, eh? Ah, there you are, Judith. Thanks for your invaluable help. Oh, I say! Fair old bit of crackling, that movie. <laughs> She's my daughter, sir. She ought to what? <laughs> Well, let her then. I don't care. <laughs> Through Judith being here, I have definite proof that these men have been having all their wardroom liquor flown over from Jersey by a naval helicopter. Getting all their wallop from Jersey, eh? Every last drop of it, sir. And duty free. Duty free? What a thumping good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd... Oh, why... What? <laughs> why didn't I think of that years ago? That's what I like to see in junior officers. Initiative. Congratulations, number one. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. But, but you can't mean to let it go on like this, sir. Like this? Certainly not. I want me cut. <laughs> Ten percent in gin. Oh, well, I'm sure something could be arranged, sir. But it better be. I <laughs> wondered what all the secrecy was about. Jolly decent of you to tip me off, Povey. Tip you off? But... Well, I shan't forget you in a hurry for this. Oh, <laughs> but I... Won't forget me, sir. Oh, well, I, I just thought... Uh, that, uh, well done. I say, number one, any chance of my taking some of the stuff back with me? Getting a bit short, you know. Uh, well, I'm sure we could find a little, sir. Well done again. A three-ton truck full will do to be going on with. <laughs> three-ton a full? Oh, blimey, Uncle Herbert, he's in the rattle. What is it, Chief? Oh, uh, well, sir, a, a slight misunderstanding, sir, with the local uh, constabulary and the in the sir. <laughs> They've knocked off a certain relative of mine who happened to have a three-ton of a bore a striking resemblance. Uh, this relative of yours wouldn't be the one who does removal work from time to time by any chance? Well, he has been known to uh, sort of shove things around a bit, sir. Yeah, ah, I see. A uh, case of mistaken identity, obviously. Oh, yeah, completely, sir. Yeah, completely. Mm. Well, I'll have a word with the police station and prize him out at once so he can run a few vital supplies down to the Admiral's launch. I think I can safely say he'll be most appreciative of your call, sir. Oh, well, come on, Povey. We can't hang about here all day. No, uh, uh, certainly, sir. At once, sir. Uh, no, no, no. One moment, Commander Povey. I think you've forgotten something. What? Uh, Judy Kins is going with Daddy Kins, I trust. Well, oh, very well. Come on, Judy. Oh, how absolutely first class us. I shall be back in time for Twisher's party in Pompkins. <laughs> oh, Lummikins. <laughs> Goodbye. Can't anybody shut a door without slamming it? Apparently not. Uh, now, Chief, you'd better phone up Fleet Air on Jersey and lay on extra supplies for the wardroom. Uh, we don't want to run short. Oh, I say, um, I take it the Admiral will get Uncle Hildebrand out of the rattle long enough to fly the supplies over occasionally. So we're bound to Chief. It's been a grand morning for dropping Daddykins in it, hasn't it? Hey! <laughs> That was Dennis Price, John Pertwee and Leslie Phillips working their passage in the Navy Lark, written by Laurie Wyman. Dennis Price was the number one, John Pertwee was the chief petty officer, Leslie Phillips was the sub-lieutenant. Commander Povey was played by Richard Caldicott, Abel Seaman Johnson was Ronnie Barker, Judith was Heather Chasen, the Admiral was Tenniel Evans, and Ginger was played by Michael Bates. The recorded production was by Alistair Scott Johnston. <laughs>
How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? It is our privilege to bring you at this time an eyewitness report of the first international trepidation contest. We are speaking to you from the ringside of the great Maple Leaf Auditorium, which is packed to the rafters with spectators, eager and curious. For the benefit of my listeners who are not acquainted with the facts relating to this event, it might be well to describe the two contestants. Lord Windesmere from uh, Wapping Fog Hole in Devonshire is, of course, the champion of the British Empire. The challenger is Paul Boomer, native son of Australia, who, I understand, worked his way to Canada in the crew of an ocean freighter carrying a load of Melbourne cabbage, upon which, uh, so it is stated, Boomer trains exclusively. Uh, ah, I see now there's a bit of a flurry around Lord Windesmere's entrance. And yes, here he comes, Lord Windesmere. I'll see... I'll see if I can get him to come to the microphone and say a few words. Joe! Joe, we'll see if we can get, get his lordship to come over here for a minute. Uh, tell him it's for the radio. Okay, I'll get him for you. Uh, thanks. Well, our Lord Windesmere appears to be in good spirits. He's smiling and chatting. Thrown about him is a beautiful silk dressing gown of perfect purple velvet upon which is worked, I imagine, to be the, the coat of arms of the House of Windesmere. It's a beautiful thing. A uh, good boy, Joe! Uh, in just a minute, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to have his lordship himself come to the microphone and... Say a few words. Right over here, please. Right over here. Yeah, yeah, right here. Yes. Yes, folks, here he is. Right in the microphone. The champion himself, Lord Windesmere. Uh, Your Highness, uh, how did you come to take an interest in this uh, unusual art? Well, I suppose you could say it all started over Lady Windesmere's fan. I see. Yes, I noticed she was constantly waving this fan in front of her face, so I asked her why did you she did it. Uh, so she retorted that if I insisted on constantly crepitating, she had to fan away in pure self-defense, you see. Well, uh, uh, my friends were drawn into the controversy and persuaded me to capitalize on my proficiency and sort of, uh, sort of going for it and all that. Uh, that. That's all. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. Thank you, and good luck to you. That was Lord Windersmere, a champion crepitator of the British... Oh, and here's a challenger. Here's Paul Boomer from Australia. Paul, over here, please. Please, ask Mr. Boomer to come over here, please. The radio, we want to speak on the radio. Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. I think we'll have Paul Boomer for you right away. Yes, here he comes. His attendant has just pointed us out. And uh, how did Paul... How? Uh, he just waves his hand in greeting and starts walking over to the microphone. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Paul Boomer. Uh, will you say hello to our audience, Mr. Boomer? Hello, Canada! Uh, now, tell me, sir. When did you first realize that you were... Uh, Proficient enough to take a uh, uh, shot at the uh, Empire Championship. Well, ever since I was a little nipper, I liked to fart. I remember I used to make my mother and father laugh their bleeding heads off when I used to let one go in church during the announcement of the ladies' aid. Hey, excuse me, Mr. Boomer, on the radio, we call it uh, crepitating. Now, look here, copper. What I always says is a fart's a fart, whether you raise up on one cheek and sneak or whether you give it a full blast like I do. Very well. As long as the CBC is no objection. <laughs> I personally find the four-letter word much easier to say and uh, more descriptive than the longer and more academic uh, crepitating. Thank you. And I would like to say... Oh, and there's the bell. Thank you, Mr. Boomer. And good luck. Paul Boomer hurries off to the center of the arena to meet the champion and to receive instructions. Now the house lights are dimming and the great flood of high-powered electric light cascade down onto the center of this a great arena where stands... In simple eloquence, uh, the farting post. The farting post is about four feet high and is decorated with red, white, and blue bunting up to about nine inches from the top. The bare top section is worn smooth by the grip of many hands in previous contests. And now it appears that Paul Boomer is to be the first at the post. Now that, I believe, is customary for the challenger to make the first effort. Yes, Paul Boomer takes off his dressing gown and strides to the farting post. He grips it firmly around the top and flexes his knees. He signals to commence has not yet been given, so we may assume that these are just preliminaries. I think I have time to describe Mr. Boomer's outfit. He's stripped from the waist up and wears a tight-fitting trunks of powder blue trimmed with scarlet. These trunks are similar to those worn by wrestlers with one important difference. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a hole about six inches in, the di in diameter removed from the seat. This, of course, has been done for obvious reasons. This symmetrical aperture is called the fenêtre de brise, literally translated meaning the zephyr window. Mr. Boomer's finesse de Bries has a scarlet trim around its perimeter, giving a very provocative air to this genial Australian backside. <laughs> and there goes the signal to commence. You might have heard it over the microphone. A, a blast on the medieval Bronx Cesar Spiegel, the traditional woodwind instrument associated with this sport for centuries. And now a hush falls on the vast, the vast throng as Boomer walks slowly, deliberately to the farting post. 
He's exuding confidence, and he gives one last all-encompassing grin to the tense audience as he grips the farting post between a pair of hands that look as though they could splinter the post. Now he flexes his knees, much in the manner of a boxer. He seems to be concentrating on the very top of the farting post. You can hear a pin drop, and here it comes. Oh, a beauty, a beauty. I think it was a triple flutter blast. Yes, that's what the judge signals. A triple flutter blast. That gives him 25 points right off the bat. And, and another, another of the same, and another 25 points. That's followed by one, no, two, fuzzy, I beg your pardon, three fuzzy farts in rapid succession. It's amazing how this man can change pace and style of offering by a slight, simple shifting of his buttock area. He's still gripping the post in complete concentration. Boomer now has a score of uh, uh, 65. Those last three fuzzy farts at five points apiece, adding 15 to his previous score. And now here's something coming. A flooper! A flooper! A perfectly executed flooper! What's that? I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. That was a follow-up flooper. A follow-up flooper. The second time in the history of this sport that a follow-up flooper has been achieved in open competition. The only other time, I believe, was during the World Series held in Europe in 1783. During the course of this series, uh, Francois Fouffe, the famous French father, after leaving uh, a follow-up flooper, defeated Sandy McWind, his Scottish opponent, by only one bloop and then dropped dead. As you know, since then, in honor of Monsieur Fouffe, the bloop had been dropped from open competition. And now the score is 105 for Boomer. Flooper, of course, counts 10 points, but a follow-up flooper, a very difficult maneuver, gives 40 points. Well, this certainly has been a whirlwind session. I think that Paul Boomer is about played out or blown out, as they say. Uh-huh. What, what am I saying? Uh-huh. A fuzzy fart and another. That gives him ten more points. And he's not through yet, apparently. Wait a minute. Here comes uh-huh. a, a three. Oh, oh, a little three. Worth only two points and very dangerous. Uh-huh. And another. Uh-huh. A, and another three. Well, not bad. Uh-huh. Well, well, he's certainly putting up a fight. <laughs> well, he's certainly putting up a fighting finish. Four three. A very hazardous, uh, very hazardous fart because of the danger of plotting. But giving him eight, a very valuable point. And there he throws up his hands. He throws up his hands as a signal that he's finished. And the crowd gives him a tremendous ovation. He's, he's sitting down, looking a little pale, a little wan perhaps, but smiling, smiling happily at the crowd. This man has a definite charm about him that has endeared him to all except the most rabid Windesmere fan. And uh, his result, wait a minute. Oh, Boomer! One hundred and twenty-three points! Did you hear that, Paul Boomer? A hundred and twenty-three points, a world record, beating Lord Windersmith's previous world mark of one hundred and nineteen by four points. Paul Boomer, this moment, is the world champion. But for how long, we don't know, because Lord Windersmith might take it right back again. And here's his lordship now walking up to the post, apparently not in the least disconcerted by the brilliant performance of the challenger. He's outfitted a little differently from Paul Boomer, he has purple tights, full-length tights, and around the finesse de bris, you remember the hole cut out from the center of his seat, around this there's a fringe of little gold tassels about four inches long. This, no doubt, is some decoration affected by... Uh, just a moment. Seems to be some sort of a dispute here. Paul Boomer and his seconds are on their feet and seem to be arguing with the judges and, and pointing to the fringe on their champion's posterior. Oh, I see. I see Paul Boomer is claiming that the fringe might add a whistle or some other sound to... Lord Windersmith's efforts and so increase their value. And after all, in a closely fought contest like this, every little advantage must be jealously watched. The judges appear to be agreeing with Paul Boomer, and they direct the champion to remove the fringe. He doesn't like the decision very much, and the crowd is getting... The crowd's getting resentful. They think he should be a better sport about it. And I agree with him. Oh, he seems to have decided that he's got to give in, and he rips off the fringe and flings it to the ground. Then he walks over to where Boomer is sitting. He turns his back. Puts his hands on his hip and... Oh! Oh, he leaves a threep right in Paul Boomer's face. The crowd get a, a kick out of this. As you know, a threep is a very low scorer, only two points. But to throw one away just in a gesture of defiance demonstrates the spirit of dash and recklessness which has made the Englishman the champion that he is. He's smiling disdainfully now as he returns to the center of the arena. He nods to the judge to show he's ready. And he... Hello, what's this? He's not going to use a farting post. Lord Windesmere, the champion, in a final gesture of contempt, scorns the use of the farting post. Well, this is developing into a bit of a grudge contest. He has his hands on his hips, feet apart, knees, 
slightly bent, and... Uh, a Sizzler. His first attempt is... A, and another one. Two in a row. And another one. A third. Three Sizzlers in a row. A tremendous effort. 60 points in his first 30 seconds. I guess. <laughs> Three sisters in a row. A tremendous effort. 60 points in his first 30 seconds. This one. And one, two, three, four. Four fuzzes. Four fragrant fuzzes in rapid succession. It's a pleasure to see the ease and comfort with which his lordship leaves his part. Perfect technique. And now his score is 80 points. 80 points in the first 30 seconds of the post. Now he's getting ready again. Hands on hips. A little bit red in the face as he strains to... Oh. Something's there. Wait a minute. Something's wrong. His attendants run into him. He's in some kind of distress. I see. Yes, the judge's signal. It was a plot, sir. Oh, hard luck, your lordship, sir. Hard luck. The champion left a very bad plot, sir, and will be penalized 15 points. That puts him back to 65 points, 59 short of the 124 he needs to retain his championship. He's all set again and seems to be straining a little more cautiously. And here is... A thunder's break. Oh, a beautiful bit of wind-breaking virtuosity. A most difficult, a most difficult part to perform without clutching. This man has wonderful control, and the crowd are really warming up to him. That last, that, that thunder's break counts 30 points. And it takes Lord Windesmere up to 95 points. It's getting very tense now. And here it is. Here is the next one. A trail blow. A trail blow. Ten points. Followed, followed by a resounding single flutter blast. I think that is. Wait. Yes, the judges uh, proclaim that to be a, a single flutter blast. A lovely, a lovely change of pace there. And now the excitement is growing unbearable as the champion uh, takes a step away from the post. And his score is... 120, just three points short of the Paul Boomer mark. Just three points short. If he gets one, one more fuzzy or two small freaks, it's all over with the shouting, and the challenger will have to return to Australia with his shattered hopes. I think everyone's heart aches for Paul Boomer. He's really a great guy, but uh, Windy Smear steps up to the post again and looks very confident as he gets ready for the killing. And here it comes, uh, a, a three. A three. That's two more points. A little small three was all it was. Two points. And now it's practically over. Just one more of those little three. Those little two-point three in the contest will be over. It seems as though his lordship was deliberately tormenting Boomer by dallying. But Boomer's smiling. It's a fourth smile, but he's trying hard. He's sitting there trying hard to take it like the grand sportsman that he is. But you can see defeat standing ready to sweep away his dreams at almost any instant. And now Lord Windersmere steps forward, and hello, hello, he's going to use the farting post for his final effort, it seems. Uh, flexes his knees. It looks as though he's going to try for a high-scoring effort for a whirlwind finish, perhaps another Sisler. And now he's trying very hard. The veins are, are starting out on his forehead, and even the trickle of perspiration venturing down his temple seems to hesitate so that this mighty last effort should have undivided attention. Now, the suggestion of a smile from the champion. He seems to have decided just what treatment is going to give this final bid. I see the audience almost to a man is on its feet, breathless and tense. He closes his eyes. A look of pure ecstasy on his face. Oh! Oh, he shits! The champion is disqualified! Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as a special service feature, we have brought you direct from the ringside of the Maple Leaf Auditorium a blow-by-blow -blow description of the first trepidation contest hung, held under international auspices. This broadcast replaced midweek meditations usually heard at this time. Your narrator, Sidney S. Brown. Listening with a smile. Keep jumping, follow suit. You're gonna have a bright new future. I feel a right now, I'm standing.
standing around here waiting for this geezer. I wish she'd hurry up. A right darling like me and he ain't turned up yet. Wait till I get my hands on him. I want half give him what for. Stone me. Here he comes at last. I bet he's got a right load of old top fault up. Hello, darling. Where have you been, my darling? Hey, well, to tell you the truth. What kept you oh so late? Well, it was like this, you see. I've been waiting round for hours. Yeah, well, I've got as far as the bus stop. For you to keep our dates. Hang on a minute, love, I'm trying to tell There's you. There's some I? lipstick on your collar. Oops. Well, that's easy to Quite explain. Quite a pretty shade of pink. Uh, you remember last Turn night? Turn around and look me straight in the eyes and it better be a blooming good life. Well, as I was saying, there was this bird, see, waiting for her geezer. Did and your he... baby sister kiss ya? Are you kidding? What would I be doing Just kissing me? Just before you came away. Come on, Vic, don't be funny. Did you think I'd never... If only you'd listen for a minute now. Now what you got a say? I'm still trying. You're not going to know what's out. Once you came on tired. Oh, I've heard of a tired bus. Or did you have to walk for miles? Is this weather your turn joke? Turn around and look me straight in the eyes and it better be a blooming good lie. Look, darling, I... This is not the first time you've turned up late before. Well, you don't have to rub it in, do you? Put the lipstick on your collar. She make you late, my darling. You don't make me late. What does she mean to you? How do I know? I don't even know who you're talking I about. I can't go on, my darling. Thank God. Well, built that. Thinking in. maybe we are through. Tell me, she did not go Tell on. Tell me you'll forget her, darling. Okay, okay, so I've forgotten that. Tell me <gasps> so I'll know it's true. It's true. Turn around and look me straight in the eyes, and it better be the truth. Oh, so help me, I shall forget me, lady. You've got lovely eyes, darling. I've forgot you one. Darling, do, you think you do me a favour, will you? You can't get a word in edgeways. Niggle, 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 rhubarb, rhubarb, funny, funny. What's it going to be like when we're cutting carry? Do you think I want it to be late? Shut your trap! Shut your trap! Well, whee! 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 We present Harry Worth in Things Could Be Worse, written by David McKellar and David Renwick, with John Baddeley, John Graham and Miriam Margulies. Episode 1, The Blackmail Letter. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a wonderful... Oh, dear. I wonder what the time is. There's one way to find out. Look at your watch, which says half past two. I better switch on the wireless and listen to the news. But let's hope it's not something terrible and disturbing. In a few moments, the David Hamilton Show. It is something terrible and disturbing. <laughs> Now it's over to the BBC newsroom and the news read by Fosdai Crisp. This is George Potter with the news. <laughs> and first, crime. Only a few minutes ago, BBC newsreader Fosdai Crisp was mugged outside Broadcasting House. Broadcasting House is the nothing sacred anymore. The next thing you know, they'll be mugging people inside Westminster Abbey. Earlier today, five people were mugged inside Westminster Abbey. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell you? What is being done about these vagabonds? What are the courts of justice doing? The judges strike. Clearly not a lot. <laughs> Members of the bench are demanding salary increases to meet inflation. The authorities have been given 28 days to pay or go to jail. And now, <laughs> the latest on the Manchester United Football Club story. When the troops first moved in at 10 o'clock... <laughs> well, I can't take any more of this. I don't know what the world is coming to... I'm so glad I live here, here, where I can enjoy the suburban peace and quiet of Melbourne Crescent. 
Is that short sighted postman looking for my doorbell? <laughs> I bet it's a second class letter. The first class postman never makes all that noise. <laughs> oh, good morning, miss. His eyes are worse than I thought. I am not a miss. Really? Oh, sorry, dreadfully sorry. I didn't realise you were married. Look, I was looking for your doorbell, man. <laughs> now, here's your two letters, and there is excess postage to pay on both of them. Well, that's not my fault. Since the General Post Office increased the price of postage, no one has been using stamps anymore. And another thing, this letter is from the GPO. It's a letter from the GPO without a stamp. Yes, yeah, well, we've got to cut costs somehow. <laughs> And it's a bill for the excess postage I've already refused to pay. This is an outrage. Yes, well, now, that's 13 pence each. Uh, that's 26 p, please, sir. Very well, here you are. And I hope Tom Jackson gets green fly in his moustache. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, then, madam. Good morning. Wait, mind the... Uh... <laughs> Alsatian dog. <laughs> He's dangerous, as you've discovered. Oh, never mind. I must remember to put up a larger beware of the dog notice. That one's no good. It's only 22 foot by 10. <laughs> ah, wonder who this letter is from. What's this? The letter is made up from pieces cut out of a newspaper. I don't believe it. It looks like a blackmail letter. Blackmail letter? Don't read it here. Better go back inside and read it. If you don't, that Mrs. Grouse from number 41 will see it through her binoculars. <laughs> but we can't have that. If she finds out, the entire Crescent will have signed a petition before you can say Enoch Powell. Good Lord, I've just said it. <laughs> Get inside, there's not a moment to lose. What does it say? No, it is a blackmail letter. And furthermore, it's made me pay for the stamp. <laughs> is there no integrity left anymore? Let's see what it says. Your sacrete is out. <laughs> sacrete, he must mean secret. And there seems to be a lot of spelling mistakes in these cuttings. Put 5,000 ponds <laughs> in old notes outside the hollow tree in the knicker's garden. <laughs> in the vicar's garden. By 7 o'clock, all the pictures go to the newspapers for the morning dress. <laughs> Yours, Trudy, the black sailor. Trudy, what a funny name for a black sailor. I wonder who he is. Well, it could be anybody. And the nerve of the man. I'm surprised he hasn't charged me VAT. Just a minute, there's something on the back. <laughs> P.S. plus 8% VAT. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I'm a respectable citizen. I mean, what can I have done? What does the blackmailer know? I've done nothing to be blackmailed for. Unless... Unless you count. No. That's not worth 5,000 pounds. A thousand at the most. <laughs> he couldn't know about that anyway. Could he? I mean, it was dark at the time anyway. <laughs> no, that's totally out of the question. Besides, everybody dumps their refuse on that piece of ground. <laughs> what am I going to do? I shall have to pay. Pay. I cannot risk it. I cannot risk my face appearing in the Daily Express. No one can. <laughs> the old Crescent would be up in arms. The entire battalion of right-wing bigots. Oh, I know that lot. I can hear them now crying out for my blood. Mr. Worth, Mr. Worth, are you in? Oh, they're here. <laughs> it's Mrs. Grouse from number 41. She must have seen the note through her binoculars. Mr. Worth, I have here a petition. Oh, dear, she didn't waste any time. Hurry up, Mr. Worth. I knew you're in. I'll be deported from the Crescent. I never quite fitted in any way. They were all too toughy nose for me. I could not have put up with their selfish, middle-class, hypocritical attitudes much longer. Mr. Worth, it's a petition against the socialists. Where do I sign? <laughs> Why did you take so long to answer the door, Mr. Worth? Ah, well, I was reading a blackmail. Ah, a blackmail. I was dealing with some black blackmail. Uh, Where would you like me to sign this petition? Don't tell me I know on the bottom. Come on, Mr. Worth, I haven't got all day. Yes. Sign here, please. Yes. Here, here, and here. Just a minute, Mrs. 
Is it not customary to sign just once? Yes, but we must get as many signatures as possible, Mr. Weller. <laughs> That's the only way the council will take any notice. Mm, how many signatures have you got? Three hundred. There's only sixty residents in the Crescent. <laughs> Besides, 300 isn't enough. I tell you what, I've still got a lot left over from the Hang the Railway Workers petition last June. <laughs> then there's the H-bomb Stamford Bridge petition. And don't forget the petition for keeping the royal family wiped. Yes. <laughs> still, that should be enough. I've got to rush now anyway. I'm starting up a petition to stop the public indulging in gambling. You will never stop people gambling, Mrs. Grouse. Do you want to take a bet? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later. Goodbye. By the way, mind the postman. <laughs> Still, nevertheless, things could be worse. She could have found out about the blackmail note. Blackmail note. Yeah, I must do something about it. What? Let me think about it. I thought about it. Got it. <laughs> I shall telephone the police. That's what I'll do. It's at times like this that one needs a friendly, responsible and understanding person in authority to help one out. Until I find one, the police is the only answer. <laughs> nine. 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 <laughs> this is ridiculous. Nine, nine, nine engaged. How am I going to contact the police? <laughs> For heaven's sake, who on earth can this be? Officer, I don't want to be disturbed. Goodbye. Now, where was I? Just one more. Officer? That was a policeman at the door. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. This is really fantastic. I just telephoned your establishment. You were engaged. I'm very sorry to disturb you, sir, but this is a matter of some uh, importance. You are quite right. It is a matter Could of... you tell me the time, sir? <laughs> Yeah, it's three o'clock. Actually, I'm very glad you decided to call. I'm in a spot of trouble, you know. Trouble, sir? Blackmail. Big pardon, sir? Blackmail. Uh, pardon? I said blackmail! <laughs> the reason I was whispering because I didn't... Because I didn't want the neighbours to hear. Come inside. I'd like to come inside as well, constable. <laughs> Sir. <clears throat> Blackmail, eh, sir? Mm -hmm. Well, you can relax. You'll be all right now. Have no fears. Uh, oh, you've no idea. That's very reassuring. Yes. You did the right thing, sir, telling the police. We'll help you. Don't you worry about a thing. Oh, that's good. You, you know, you're most kind. Now, sir, who exactly have you been blackmailing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just... I haven't been blackmailing anybody. They all say that, sir. I am the one who's being blackmailed. I am the victim. Oh, the victim. Oh, I see. A social reprobate, eh? One of the parasitic minority indulging in counterproductive egotism. I beg your pardon? Sociologically, your intolerance of communal adversity is the epitome of despicable dogma, sir. <laughs> You are a police officer, aren't you? <laughs> of course I am, sir. We're a new breed, sir. <laughs> Look, Constable, this man has committed a criminal offence. It's up to you to get out your truncheon. Whip him in the scrubs. Oh. <laughs> you fascist pig, sir. This is social bigotry at its height. Have you ever stopped to think that this man probably came from a broken home? Certainly, officer. He was probably the one who broke it. <laughs> Next thing you'll be telling me was beaten up every day by the heavy brigade in the kindergarten. This warped his little mind. And by the time he was nine years old, he was running a fixed upscotch ring and a loaded marble school. <laughs> there. Wrong of it. I ought to be glad he's blackmailing me. It's given me a chance to pay back my debt to society. Oh, well, that's it, sir. You seem to have a firm understanding of him now. I understand him perfectly, officer. Some 11 year old Al Capone is trying to collect £5,000 from me. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Just gone three, did you say? Oh, I must be off. Somebody's parking meter runs out in two minutes. <laughs> Afternoon, all. Thank you, Constable. 
That's the last time I watched the Sweeney. <laughs> what shall I do now? Well, I'll have another try at telephoning the police station. Nine. 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 <laughs> Still engaged. <laughs> They're probably all on the phone to the speaking clock. <laughs> I haven't any time to waste. There's nothing else for it. What to do? Just simply have to pay. I have to go to the bank, draw the money out. Five thousand pounds. Five thousand. Wait a minute, though. Less thirteen p for the excess postage. He'll soon learn I can't be twisted that easily. <laughs> no, 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 not me. Yes, you. What's the matter with everybody today? Ugh, oh, sir, help me. You damn security the glass. A sassenach of a bank clock. Can't understand what I'm seeing. There's no need to get your spot on in a twist. <laughs> Look, see, I'm I've been here 20 minutes and I'm now getting through because of this glass. I can't make the way I see understand a blind word. At least I know my admit and I feel a right Jesse Jimmy. <laughs> that security glass is put up for a very good reason. To stop villains and robbers shooting innocent bank clerks who are employed to look after our money. A little inconvenience is a small price to pay for protection. Besides, if you spoke English, the young lady would be able to understand you. <laughs> I tell you what, you go before me, Jimmy, and see how you get on. Go on, go on, I'll wait. You go mean on. I can go before you? Hey. Well, that's very kind, it really is. It? Now, it's quite simple, really. Watch me. <laughs> Excuse me, miss. I wish to see the manager to draw out £5,000. <laughs> can you understand what I'm saying? It's half past three. <laughs> <laughs> I say, can you understand me? I want the manager. I've just told you it's half past three. <laughs> this is taking security too far. I want the manager. You see what I mean, Jimmy? I believe in security as much as the next man. Yeah, well, I am the next man, Jimmy, but I didn't believe in it. <laughs> I didn't believe it myself. With a carry-on like this, it's impossible to draw any money out. No wonder the banks make such huge profits. <laughs> <laughs> Look, miss... I wish to draw out £5,000. Get me the manager. My name is Harry Worth and my account number is 5871-2R3. And I have a little squiggly bit on the bottom. Oh! I've never been so insulted in all my life. That's right, Worth. <laughs> <laughs> Will you please get me the manager? Oh, how dare you! If you don't desist, I shall get the manager. Mr Cartwright? All right, Miss Peabody, I'll deal with this. Ah, oh, yes, I recognise you, sir. Uh, 5871 stroke 2R3, isn't it? Uh, with a little squiggly bit on the bottom. How dare you, sir? <laughs> I want to draw out £5,000. Uh, just gone half past. <laughs> this is hopeless. Wait a minute. I shall write it down. I want to take out all my money. There you are. I want to take out all my honey... Eh? What do you say? I still can't understand. Open the window. I'm sorry, I can't understand you. Uh, hang on, I'll open the window. <laughs> I uh, can't read your writing, Mr. Worth. I want to take out all my honey. I mean, this is a bank, not a health food store. <laughs> the last one is money, not honey. Mr. Cartwright, forget the note. I want to draw out all my money in the account. Five thousand pounds. And I want it in ones. Oh, why didn't you say so in the first place? Here you are. One thousand, two, three, four, five. Thank you very much and good day. Uh, I see. Excuse me, Jimmy. Could I have a word with you? Certainly. What is it? Hand it over. <laughs> Hand it over? I the money, you dumpster. Come on, the loot, the five thousand pounds. Hand it over before I blow your brains out. <laughs> You're a thief. That's it, Jimmy, that's it. Now, I was trying to rob the bank when you came in, but they can't understand me. Now, you've managed to get some money out, and you can have it all. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Uh, all the best to you, then, Jimmy. <laughs> Help. Mr. Cartwright, Mr. Cartwright, there's been a bank robbery. Oh, wrong. There's been a Mr. Worth robbery. <laughs> <laughs> that money was officially out of the bank. Good afternoon. Excuse me, but I must close the security window. We don't want to be robbed, do we? <laughs> right, right, that does it. You force me into this, Mr. Cartwright. I am not a violent man, my nature, but I must ask you to hand over £5,000. This is a stick-up. Mr. Cartwright... 
Can you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm not giving you it. I order you to. No, you're not getting it. For the very last time. No, it's out of the question. You'll have to get a watch of your own. Come <laughs> on, Wayne. Help. Police. Help. Who is that officer again? Oh, that was clever. He hasn't even got a car. <laughs> All right, we know you're in the bank, Worth, and we are coming in to get you. <laughs> now then, are you going to come quietly? Look, Constable, I can explain. I am innocent. I'm an innocent victim of a chain of events over which I have no control. All right, sir, but I have one question to ask you. Certainly not. I'm not answering questions until I've spoken to my solicitor. Very well, sir. There's just one thing. What's that, sir? I haven't got one. <laughs> me, sir. I am a solicitor. My card, Mr. George And. George And? Yes, sir, of Ponsonby, Ponsonby and Ponsonby. <laughs> well, I think, well, Mr. And, you are now my solicitor. Start soliciting. Yes, sir. I'm very good, sir. <laughs> Our constable, my client refuses to answer any questions until he has been charged and cautioned. Mr. Worth, you are charged with obstructing the police with their inquiries. Anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. I right, thank you, constable. Now you may ask your question. Very well. Could you tell me the time, sir? <laughs> Please don't answer that. Time? Is that all you can think of? Here, take my watch. I never want to see it again. Oh, thank you very much, sir. 3.45? Oh, dear. Is that the time? Well, I must hurry. I've got to see a man about a dog licence. Uh, excuse me, Mr Worth. Uh, here is the bill for my services. £250? You don't understand. I haven't got any money now. Yes, God, well, that would appear to be your problem. However, if you're short of money, I strongly advise you see my brother-in-law. He runs a financial house at 123 Gasworks Terrace. Oh, well, thank you for the advice. Oh, that's perfectly all right, sir, perfectly all right. Yes, that'll be another hundred pounds. <laughs> I can see it all now. There's still a law for the rich and a law for the poor, isn't there? Mr. Worth, so you don't expect me to answer that question for nothing, do you? Good, <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, not so far, it isn't. <laughs> Only one thing to do. Better do as he said, see this financial expert. Taxi! <laughs> 123 Gasworks, Derrick's police. Righto, Governor. You might have waited until I got him first. <laughs> Good, here's another cap. Taxi! <laughs> Follow that cab. Okay, mate. He's done the same thing. <laughs> this is hopeless. I shall have to walk. Okay, what do you want then, Jimmy? <laughs> I would like a loan immediately. Huh? Five thousand pounds. Hey, just. It's no locked. <laughs> Pardon me. It's just a thought. Yeah. Haven't we met before somewhere? What? No, 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 Jimmy. That was not me in the bank this afternoon. That was my twin brother. The mm. <laughs> <laughs> right villain is my twin brother, Jimmy. It's strange, you see. I, I could have sworn I'd seen that stocking mask before. <laughs> the ladder's in the same place. <laughs> oh, jeez, and the new one today. Well, anyway, could we get down to business now, do you think? Are you okay, now, look, I'm doing this because I feel sorry for you, Jimmy. I feel very sorry for you. Now, here is the money. Thank you. Just a moment. These notes are still wet. I'm not taking these. I'll have some of those out of the airing cupboard. <laughs> now, look, don't you want to make a note of my collateral? Uh, yeah. Have you got a pen? Yes, here. Oh, that's enough collateral for me, Jimmy, then. <laughs> Right, sign here, 25% interest. Oh, right. well, now that sounds reasonable enough. Hold on. What's this here? What's this on this banknote? Mm, uh, oh, oh, that's just, just the, the watermark. That's nothing. Ah, two ply with wet strength. <laughs> <laughs> sounds familiar somehow. There we are. By the way, when exactly is the loan to be repaid? 
The 15th of July. <laughs> Today is the 16th. Uh, it seems you're in a wee bit of trouble there, Jimmy. <laughs> to the debt collectors. Uh, you can expect a visit from the later on today. All right, I'll be seeing you then, sir. No, no, hang on. What do you mean, debt collectors? Help, please. I've been swindled. Help. Police. Police. It's always the same. Never around when you really need them. <laughs> Wait a minute, I've got an idea. Could someone tell me the time? Half past four. <laughs> There you are. Oh, good. I need protection. Oh, sorry, Mr. Worth. I can't stop. I'm on my way to Melbourne Crescent. Ah, obviously you're ahead of me then. In that case, you can give me a lift. Now hold still while I jump on your back. <laughs> ah, that's the house, Constable. That one there, where those two old people are loading my furniture into that cart. Sorry, sir, but my business is further up the Crescent. Evening all. But my furniture. Look, they're stealing all my furniture. Oh, no, no, we ain't, mate. No, we're taking finance company furniture. The head of finance company. <laughs> this is an outrage. Where did I go wrong? I read all the small print. Well, well you should have read the big print then, shouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> You've taken everything but the kitchen sink. Oh, don't worry, we haven't finished yet, sir. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. You can only take what's owing. I mean, what value have you put on these goods you're removing? Oh, see, what do you mean, all together? Yes. Yeah, well, let me see. Now, there's the colour sets, the cula beds, plus the gentles, and the scurries. I don't know with you. 70. 70 nonsense. The chairs are Georgian for a start. All right, then. Right, 80. 80? How dare you, sir? The table is Victorian. Well, sir, you do drive a hard bargain, sir. 90. You haven't noticed the cutlery is genuine Elizabethan. Yeah, first or second? <laughs> Second. 95. 95, 95. It's not nearly enough. All right, then. One pound and not a penny more. <laughs> a pound? Done. I certainly have been. Rose? Yes, Fred? Rose, take this lot and put it into the car. Right oh, Fred. What kept you, Rose? <laughs> yeah, they got stuck on the stairs, Fred. <laughs> now, what's next, Fred? Yeah, what? Well, this is next, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> No, not my wall-to-wall -wall carpets. Now, and this. The wallpaper as well. Wait, you can't take the floorboards, can you? Uh... Oh, you can. <laughs> Am I going to walk about on the joists? Did you ever get the feeling that you shouldn't have got up this morning? <laughs> no use. Can't take any more. Blackmail for £5,000 plus VAT. Robbed of all my money, conned by a solicitor, swindled by a Scotsman in a pinstripe kilt. <laughs> now then, there's nothing else left. I'm going to put my head in the gas oven. Careful with that gas oven, Rose. <laughs> oh, no, that's gone as well. Quite. Well, that's high-speed gas, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now, I must say, it's been a pleasure to do business with you, sir. Haven't you made one little mistake? You've left me the bricks and mortar. You don't worry, we'll be back in the morning, right? Come on, then. I'm finished. Finished. Hang on. Ah, that's a bit of luck at any rate. They've left my radio. Was mugged inside Buckingham Palace. A man with a very realistic looking corgi suit is helping police with their inquiries. <laughs> And now, crime. A daring plot has just been uncovered to blackmail prominent local citizen and founder member of the Shoot the Socialists and Bring Back Democracy Association, Mrs. Victoria Grouse. The plot apparently failed owing to the fact that the blackmail letter seems to have been delivered to the wrong address by a short-sighted postman. <laughs> the police spokesman commented, it's lucky we found out about it before any damage was done. <laughs> 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 Isn't that funny? That blackmail letter wasn't even meant for me in the first place. It was Mrs. Grouse they were blackmailing. I don't believe it. Everything that could possibly have gone wrong for me today has gone wrong. Excuse me, mate, we forgot the radio. <laughs> oh, no, not the radio. No, now, don't worry. Don't upset yourself, mate. Uh, after all... You're quite right. <laughs> Things could be worse. <laughs>
Things could be worse starred Harry Worth with John Baddeley, John Graham and Miriam Margulies. The script was written by David McKellar and David Renwick and the programme produced by Simon Brett. My little budgie follows me everywhere I go. I can't budge without him because he loves me so. Sitting on my shoulder, he chatters all the time. He knows my telephone number and every nursery rhyme. He really is a pal to me, the best I have by far. So wherever I am, you will always see my little budgery guard. Budgy, 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 budgy. Here he is. Budgie, Come on. Budgie, up on my shoulder. Up on my shoulder. Good. Budgie, budgie, Cheeky boy. Cheeky boy. Budgie, budgie, Come on now. Budgie, Say it. Budgie, Cheeky boy. Cheeky. All right then. Um, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. Come on, you love saying this. I'm in charge. Come on. He talks all the time, you know. You, you just can't stop him. He was marvellous at rehearsal. Get back in the cage. He is the cutest little bird you could wish to meet. When he keeps on talking, he's even worse than beat. Tea! Since the day I bought him, I know that I have found That I will never be lonely As long as he's around He is such good company I take him in my car So wherever I am You will always see My little budgery guard Budgie, budgie, budgie Budgie, budgie, budgie Hey boy, budgie, come on budgie, Cheeky boy budgie, Cheeky boy budgie, I'm in charge budgie, I'm in charge budgie, budgie, Come on, yeah Come on budgie, budgie, Have a fly around then budgie, Have a fly around Hello, my dear ears. I'm going to sing you a song of that great huntsman, Jim Pubes, who lived many years ago. And thank you. <laughs> and it is said there was no finer sight in Cumberland than to see old Jim straddling his nadger behind the parsonage, and and then and then looming his turves before setting off in pursuit of the quarry. And this song tells his story and goes after this fashion. <clears throat> Do you ken Jim Pubes with his plot so bright as he traddles his nadger in the bright moonlight? <laughs> he whirls his posset all through the night, but he can't turn it off in the morning. <laughs> Oh, the sound of his groat threw me from my bed As he blew up his mooly fit to waken the dead Oh, the noise of his grunge nearly blew off me head And removed all the paint from the awning <laughs> Do you ken Jim Pubes? Now his blood's turned white And his nadge has been struck with an awful blight And he can't find his posset without a light <laughs> And he can't turn it on in the morning. Oh, his poor old groat, it has sprung a leaf. And the sound of his moolies reduced to a squeak. Though he blows and he blows till he's blue in the eek. We'll no more hear him grunt. In the morning. <laughs> 
present Derek Geiler and Molly Sugden as Mr. and Mrs. Wheeler in a comedy about retirement. Home to Roost, written by Anne Jones, with Norman Rossington as Mr. Bailey. Mother. <coughs> Mother. <laughs> Mother. What, 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 what's the matter? Mother. Listen. <coughs> <laughs> what? Well. What? What did it sound like to you? What did what? Well, I didn't hear anything. Well, you did. You, you did. You must have heard. No, I didn't hear a sound. Oh, ah, yes. Now I can. It's the bus on the corner. <laughs> You've missed it, Father. I wasn't talking oh, about. Well, there'll be another one along soon. If you get a move on, you. Are you going out? No. No, Mother. I am not going out. And I am afraid I shall not be going out for a considerable time. Oh, well, they're every 20 minutes anyway. <laughs> you can take your time. Where are you going? I am not going anywhere. I just wanted you to hear... <coughs> Did you? Yes. You wanted me to hear you go... <laughs> yes. Oh. Now, what, what what does it sound like to you, dear? The, uh, that um that. <coughs> yes, yes. A little cough. Yeah. Well, I know it was a little. What I wanted, I know what it was. What I asked was, what did it sound like, dear, to you? Well. Uh, it, it sounded like a little cough. I mean, what else would it sound like? It was a cough. It was a, it, it was a cough, a little cough. A little persistent cough? No, or just like the one cough. <coughs> like anybody might do. Just like a, a one-off cough. <laughs> Why? Was there something special about it? <coughs> do it again. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a cough, all right. <laughs> oh, it, that is definitely a cough. Certainly a little cough, that is. <coughs> ah, what now? That's much better. You're getting better at it now. I don't want to get better at it. Well, what are you practising it for? <laughs> I'm not practising... I don't... I, I want to get better from it. From your cough? Hip, yes. You haven't got a cough. You I, never you, cough, you. You sneeze and you yawn and you go, ho, ho, ho. And you crack your knuckle. Oh, you make quite a lot of different noises, really. But coughing, no. Ah, you've noticed my knuckles cracking then, have you? <laughs> noticed? They do it all the time. Yes, I know they do. But they always have, haven't they? I mean, you're proud of it. You used to do it at parties. <laughs> Listen to this, you'd say, and then you'd crack your knuckles in time to red sails in the sunset. <laughs> it's your gift, Father. No, oh, well, I haven't been doing it in time to red sails in the sunset lately, have I? Well, no, no, I must admit, no, you haven't. Now, they do it by themselves. <laughs> do they? The play red sails in the sunset? All by themselves. Look, they crack by themselves, of their own volition. Crack. It's like a pistol shots going off sometimes. Do you know, Mother, in the night I woke up thinking there's an intruder shooting at me. And it, it's just my knuckles going off. Hey, I've never heard them. Oh, well, no, you wouldn't, would you, eh? No, with all the row you're making. <laughs> no. Father? No. I don't snore. Ah. Well, not that it makes any difference. 
I wouldn't sleep anyway. Hey. With my insomnia. <laughs> Your insomnia? Suffered for insomnia for years, Mother. Chronic insomnia. Oh, Lord. And how's your poor feet? Ah. Aha. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes, so at last you've noticed that, eh? What? The way I've been walking lately. How oh, uh, have you been walking? Oh, never mind. No, go on, go on, no, do it, it for me. I want to see. Go on, Father, walk. Oh. Go on, walk to and fro a bit. Let's have a look. No, no, no. Go on. Oh, well, like this. <laughs> Mother, please. You don't walk like that. I do, I do. Well, loosen your braces. <laughs> it is an ingrowing toenail makes me walk like that. <laughs> oh, ha, 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 ha. Yes, you, you may well laugh, you may well... I just wish you had it, that's all. Father, for shame. <laughs> well, no. No, I wouldn't wish this on anybody, really, no. No, not even my worst enemy. Well, why don't you go and have it seen to? Get it dug out. Oh, no, don't. <laughs> Do you want me to have a look at it? No, thank you. Come on, no, come here. Don't you, don't cut it. No, no, Mother, now. Well, I don't know what to do with you. What with your cough and your insomnia and your knuckles and your toenail growing in. And my back. <laughs> oh, heck. What's the matter with your back? Well, I don't know, do I? I mean, it's just... It's just a bad back. Don't worry, though, Mother, I... I don't want to be a trouble to you. <laughs> you just leave me. Yes, well, I do have quite a bit to do. It's a school concert this afternoon. Oh. So I suppose you won't be coming to that now, then, will you? What with your cough and your bad back and your uh, ingrowing... No, unfortunately, no. I, I think perhaps I'd better not, Mother, don't you? Oh, what a shame. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, you go, dear. You go. Don't worry about me. You go. You go. Now, just just leave me here. Yes, all right. Yeah. I'll leave you here then to suffer. <laughs> Red sails in the sunset. All day I've been blue. What's the matter with me dad? Nothing. Why? He's lying on the sofa in the other room with a rug over him. Oh, yes. Is he sick? No. He seems to be unconscious. <laughs> He's asleep. He always has a sleep about now. That's why I can't sleep at night. Except he can sleep at night. You should hear him. And he thinks he's got insomnia. Oh. <laughs> and a bad back, an ingrowing toenail, diseased knuckles and a cough. <laughs> <laughs> Not again. <laughs> oh, Gaff, if you could have seen him this morning, <laughs> showing me how he couldn't walk. He looked like, like <laughs> this. Grouch your marks. Yes, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. What's this then? <laughs> Mother-in-law. Hello. Hello. I'm just ready. I've only got to put my coat on. What's all the hilarity? Oh, me dad. Well, where is he? Flaking out in the other room. What's wrong with him? Well, he's got a bad back, mm. a cough, musical knuckles and an ingrowing <laughs> toenail, <laughs> and insomnia. <laughs> Not really. No. No, of course he hasn't. So, Dad, how did it always come on, then? Been watching those hospital programmes on telly again, I suppose, has he, Mum? Mm. Which ones? I don't know. Casualty Ward 20. <laughs> <laughs> he watched it Tuesdays. Oh, that's very good. And that one at the weekend, um, oh, what's it called? Outpatients Department. Yes, that's it. And then there's Tropical Doctor, Military M.O., Son of Dr. Kildare and the Flying Vet. <laughs> he watches them all. The Flying Vet? Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, he was worried in case he had distemper. <laughs> People don't get distemper. That's what worried him. <laughs> he gets everything. He even had hot flushes till I told him what they were. <laughs> but soon fixed that. Ooh, ooh. That's 
upset him back a lot, just when he was getting over yellow, Jack, and all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'll be my groceries. <laughs> Good morrow, gentlefolk. Good morrow. Well met. Oh, oh, just put them down ah, there, will you, ah. Mr Bailey? We're just on our way out. Oh, aye, the school concert, I surmise, the social event of the year. So, uh, where's our esteemed friend, then? Oh? His good self, the master, the lord of the manor. Oh, oh, he's... Um... I'm afraid he's going to have to miss the concert. Huh? He'll be so disappointed. Oh, what's up? Well, he's got a bag back. Insomnia. An ingrowing toenail. Musical knuckles and a cough. That's <laughs> right, put him there. Well, well just it, been... he hasn't, has he? Yeah. Mm. Mr Wheeler, he hasn't been... Satan bad, dear me. Oh, dearie, 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 dearie. Oh, Mrs. Wheeler. Poor old soul. Oh, is there anything I can do? No, no, it's only... I mean, he's only... Well, can I see him? Eh? Is he... Is he allowed visitors? Yes. Oh. <laughs> You, you can see him if you want to. He's just lying there. I mean, just look... Oh, I don't know. Perhaps you're better not now, though. I mean, he's asleep. Oh. And you're all just going out, leaving him? Oh, well, it's the concert, you see. Yeah. Charlotte's singing the good ship lollipop. Yes, and jolly good, too, I must say. I must say, Miss Owen, you're, very you're good going to just leave the old fellow. You're going to go out and, and, and leave? Well, yeah, well, it will only be a couple of hours, won't we, Ange? Well, I was rather hoping you'd all come back with us for tea. Yes, yeah, go we'd like you to come oh, round. You're going to go out to tea and a good ship lollipop and leaving the poor old... Enjoying yourselves while a poor... I'll stay with him. Will you? I will. <laughs> if you will so permit. You go off. Go on, go on, have a good time. Enjoy yourselves. Don't give a thought to lying there. I'll stay at his bedside. I won't desert him. Well, all right, then, <laughs> if you want to. But there's no need, you know. It probably won't wake up at all. Eh? <laughs> Mother-in-law, I don't want to hurry. You, yes, but, but look, all the best seats will be gone. Oh, be yes, well, 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 look, you can if you like, Mr Bailey. I mean, if you want to, but, well, there's really no need. Allow me to be the best judge of that, eh, Mrs Wheeler? And they say it's thicker than water. <laughs> oh, some of us have finer feelings, you know, compassion. Oh, come on, Mum. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, yeah, all right, come sure. on. Well, goodbye, Mrs Wheeler, have a good time. Go on, fiddle while Rome burns. Right, cheerio, oh, then, Mrs sure. Wheeler. Bye-bye. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. Jerry, 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 Jerry. Let's go and have a look at Mr. W. Mr. Wheeler. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. Oh, the poor old fella. Just look at him there. Never mind, Squire. I won't desert you. You poor old sinking ship. Sleep on. Sleep on, Macduff. And let who will be clever. Where am I? What happened? Are you all right, Mr. Wheeler? Keep calm. I'm here. Who? Oh? Who are you? I can't see you. Uh, everything's dark. I just drew the curtain, Squire, in case the light hurt your eyes. Eh? Is that you, Mr Bailey? <laughs> it is indeed, old friend. Oh, well, what are you... Uh, where, where's Mother? Where's Mother? She had to go out for a while, Squire. Oh, now, it's all right. Don't worry. I'm here. I'm with you now. Yes, but, I mean, what... what <laughs> he, he, oh! Pull, pull the curtains back. I can't see anything. I, uh, I'm at your side, Squire. Uh, can't you see me blurred outline? Do you want me to hold your hand? No. Uh, <laughs> what are you... How did you come to be with you? Where's Mother? Where, where's Mother? Gone to your granddaughter's school concert, I believe. But don't you worry about that, Squire. I won't leave you. Eh? Oh. Well, uh, what about the shop, Mr. Bell? The lovely Rackwell has taken over the reins there, Squire, in my absence. Oh. She will relieve me in one hour. Pardon? <laughs> We're doing you in shifts, Mr. Wheeler, me and Rack. An hour on, an hour off, sitting with you, watching over you, 
But what for? I mean, wh- what do you want? Now, you- then, now, then, lie back, old chap. Don't excite no, yourself. No, 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 please, no. And I it's don't... all but... right now, Mr Wheeler, my uh, dear. I beg your pardon? <laughs> just you lie there. Doggo. Now, can I get you anything? Uh, no, 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 no. Can I, I just moisten your lips with some of this glucose beverage? Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't like it. Where's Mother? I told you, at the school concert. Oh, yes, all that, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, well, uh, how are you feeling now? <laughs> oh, much the same, Mr. Uh, thank you. <laughs> much the same. Well, don't try to move. Uh, why not? You're back, Squire. Oh. Now, where's it get you mostly? Smaller the back, is it, or more in the uh, kidney region? Oh, uh, well, the small, the small. Ah, uh, yes. Just about there? Yes, about there, yes. Shh. Pardon? <laughs> oh. Nasty, that. In conjunction with the toe, nasty. Oh, oh. <laughs> is it? Oh, what in conjunction with the... Oh. It's nasty. <laughs> well, they're connected, aren't they, Squire? Hmm? The back and the toe. The backbone's connected to the hip bone. The hip bone's connected to the thigh bone. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, they're like joined together. Joined together? By my leg? Yes. <laughs> well, yes, I suppose you could say... It. That's nasty, isn't oh. it? Keep it awake at nights. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, some nights. Other nights. Mm. Uh, you see what it is. Now, this is uh, strictly between you and I, ah, Mr yeah. Bailey. You see, she denies it, of course. Oh. Uh, but Mother does have this tendency to... <laughs> no, I, I know, I yeah. know. Pardon? They just don't understand, do they, Mr Wheeler? What it's like to lie awake hours on end, night after night. Oh, no, no, well, she suddenly doesn't. Uh, <laughs> oh, out like a light, minute her head touches the pillow. Mm-hmm. Boing, gone, mm-hmm. prung, she's gone. Oh, yes. You know, I often say to her, Mother, I say, I really don't know how you can... What's that? Hmm? Oh, uh, sorry about that, Mr Bailey. It's just a little habit of mine, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was it? Uh, well, it was my... Uh, Knuckles, you see. Uh, Your knuckles? Yes, I cracked my knuckles. It's, uh, well, I've always, uh... <laughs> Mr. Bailey, I wonder, <laughs> have you, by any chance, ever heard a song entitled Red Sails in the Sunset? Uh, red sails in the sunset, oh, way, way out to the, the sea. sea. La, 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 dee, dee. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> you do that with your knuckles. Yes. <laughs> it is strong, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes I do, you know. Yes, yes, yes. I've never seen it. No. I've never heard anything. Clever. I've, clever. I've yeah. heard of people playing the spoons and the bones, yeah. but the knuckles. No. <laughs> you could go on the horse with that, Squire. Oh, no, <laughs> yes, yes, the Palladium. What? Red sails in the crack, crack. <laughs> Way out on the crack. Oh, carry my crack, crack. Home safely to crack. Oh, <laughs> what a novelty. Oh, it could sweep the country. Oh, no, no, it's nothing really, is it? Oh, I mean, well, of course, yeah, anybody can do it, of course. Could anybody learn? I mean, if I was to practice. Uh, well, well, possibly, perhaps, you see, if. Um... Uh, well, well, what is it? You, well, show me, how do you, uh, you know, what? Ah, oh, yes, well, now, you see, now, you take your knuckle. Yeah. No, 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 no that one, no, that's right. right. Now, between the thumb and the forefinger, do you yeah. see? Like that. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. You see? Now, that's yes. it, yes. And now, then you sort of. See? Uh, oh. <laughs> I'll just call him. Father! I'd like him to come for his tea. Father! Dad, come on. We're taking you to our nebs for your tea. Oh, where's he got to? He's not in the garden, is he? No, 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 he's not out there. <laughs> Can't be still asleep, can he? No, he's not in here. What's he been up to with these curtains? Father! Are you upstairs? Well, where can he be? I don't know. He didn't say he was going out. He said he wasn't going out for some considerable time. He said he felt... Oh, he hasn't fallen down behind anything, has he? <laughs> it's OK, Mum. Look, he's left you a note. It was in the kitchen. Uh, well, he has gone out. What's it say? Dear Mother, I have gone to the... <gasps> what? 
hospital. Oh, oh no. hospital? But why? Well, I mean, what? Well, no. Oh! Well, how Jack did... Bailey. He was here with him. Dad must have been taken ill suddenly. And Jack Bailey's got him into hospital. Oh! Oh, and he wrote me a note. Dear Mother. <laughs> Dear Mother. Oh! He's never had a day's ill. Yes, he has. He had one today. You said a bad back. Yes, and a cough. I mean, you said he had a cough, Mum. Oh, yes, I know. Oh, that could be anything, really, couldn't it? A bad back and a cough. Anything. Distemper? Oh, Mum. <laughs> and you made fun of him. So did you. No, I... Yes, I did. Oh. Yes, well, I suppose you're sorry now, aren't you? Oh, you <laughs> must be... You must feel awful making fun of him like that. Yes, heartless, really. No, I'm not. I'm not heartless. Oh. No, 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 no. I didn't say you were heartless, Mum. I just said it was heartless. You know, mocking, poking fun and not having any sympathy and... Laughing at him. When all the time he was in... Suffering. A... Agonies, probably. Well, I didn't know he was suffering. Well, he's always suffering. <laughs> Except he's not. He's never suffering, not really. He just thinks he is. I never take any... <gasps> oh, oh, oh Mum! <laughs> Poor old boy. Oh, oh I've been a bad wife. <laughs> It's too late to alter that now, mother-in-law. Oh! No! It may not be. Hmm? Not quite. But well, what are we all standing here for? Nev, will you take me down to the hospital? What? You know, of course, Mum. Yes, delighted. A pleasure. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna... coming too. Oh, my poor dad. My poor dad. Nev, can I drive? Ah, oh, no, Ange, no. I mean, you drove here. It is my turn. Oh, is... meanie. Well, one of you. Come on. Come on, Mum. Oh, be quick. Let's get down to that hospital. Yes, I'm just trying to think where I've put my car keys. Oh, Nev, they're in your hand. Oh, Come yes. on. <laughs> there it is, Nev, you see. Where? Where there's that big H sign on the corner. Yeah. You turn left down there. Right. It can't be far now. Oh, oh now, Mother-in-law, oh. try not to upset yourself. You mustn't let him see that you're upset, otherwise he'll guess. Guess what? That you're upset. <laughs> that if they... What? If they what? Allow anyone to see him in his condition. Oh. oh I'll let Mum in, surely, Ange. You know, next of kin. Oh, oh yes. Yes. What do you mean, she is? Here, Mum, the house is in both your names, isn't it? No. Did you? Were they the best years of your life? <laughs> they can do marvellous things now, you know, Mum, in hospitals. Can they? Do you think they can cure him? Oh, yes. Surely. What of? <laughs> Pardon? What's she got for them to cure him of? <laughs> well, it'll be his back, won't it? No, the cough, I'd say. You said he was coughing, didn't you, Mum? Yes, well, I would go for the toe, personally, every time oh, myself. Oh, what about the cough? Oh, no, if he was coughing... The cough, all the back. The toe is the thing. Anyway. The, the ingrowing no, tainer. No, I can it assure you, it's just the toe well, that did but it. But what do you think, Mother-in-law? I think that's him standing over there by that bus stop. Look! Yes, it is! Oh, it's Dad! Oh, it's him! It is! It is Father! Yoo-hoo! You! Stop the car, Nick! Stop the car! Hello. Come on, Dad. Come on, hop in. Oh, oh well, this is lucky. <laughs> oh, the concert has finished, hasn't it? Oh, Father, Father, uh, they've let you uh, out. Mother, oh, don't. Oh. Well, oh, Dad. Don't stop that, you two. What's oh. the matter Leave go. Well, it... How are you feeling now, my dear? <laughs> eh? What was it, Dad? Was it your cough, Dad? It was, wasn't it? You had a sudden, violent fit of coughing, didn't you? You were choking. Oh, and no, your back. No. Was it your back? I'll manipulate it, Father. Every night I manipulate it for you without fail. I will, I will. But why did they let you out? They, oh, didn't, it was... they didn't let me. I wasn't... It was the toe, wasn't it, Dad? The toe. You, I knew it was the toe. Rigor mortis. <laughs> 
No, my toe's perfectly all right, except when I wear those blessed chucker boots you gave me. No, I'm fine. I feel fine. Thank you. I'm fine. Fine? fine. You do not. You can't. Yes, I can. I do. I do. I feel splendid. Well, fairly splendid, yes. But how can you when you've just been... Well, why did they take you to hospital, then? They didn't take me. I took Jack Bailey. Jack Bailey? What? what do you mean you no. took Jack yeah. It must have been very sudden. Well, we were talking to him, weren't we, just a few hours ago. Oh, what a tragedy. How old was he? Yes, it was uh, <laughs> a bit sudden. <laughs> well, uh, where, uh, where did he... Uh... In the knuckles. <laughs> the knuckles, yeah. Knuckles? Uh, yeah. Well, he was trying the, uh, you know, the red sails in the sunset. <laughs> but, but, but what happened? Well, Rack walked in and he said, hang on a minute, Rack, I'm trying to crack my knuckles. And she picked up the poker and cracked them fine. <laughs> They're just bandaging him up now, you see. Oh, my word, what a... <laughs> Do you know she brought that poker down such a whack? <laughs> oh. Oh. What? It... What? Uh, can't you hear it? Uh, no. Oh, no. It must be my ears. It... Wait a minute. It's in my ears. It's a high-pitched whining noise in my ears. Oh. Oh, dear. It's I... me! It... What? It's me making a high-pitched whining noise, and if I have any more of this from you, you'll get more than a high-pitched whining noise in your ears. You'll hear bells, and you'll see stars, and you'll have a black eye and a cauliflower ear and a broken nose, and it'll be me doing it to you. Me! Oh, you had me worried to death, Father. <laughs> Bruce Stein, Derek Tyler and Molly Sankton as Mr. and Mrs. Wheeler with Norman Rossington as Mr. Bailey, John Badley was Nev, Patricia Green, Catherine, is Anne Churchman, Ange. The theme music by Alex Welsh was played by Alex Welsh and his band. The script was by Anne Jones and production in our Birmingham studios was by Trafford Whitelock.
I tell you what I'll do, I'll come straight home from work and be home rolls, you know what I mean? And you can wear your finny for like you do around the house. And we'll be okay in that and we'll be all right there. No trouble either side, you know what I mean? And your man will be all right about that, won't you? Because she's a lovely little girl. She's smashing. Oh, I love you all, man. The best We present All Gas and Gators. The Bishop Warms Up. Starring Robertson Hare, William Mervyn, John Barron and Jonathan Cecil, with this week's special guests Hugh Paddock and Frank Williams as the Vicar's Coral, and Dudley Jones as Mr. Parry Jones. <laughs> It is a bright winter morning as the Bishop's chaplain, the Reverend Mervyn Newt, comes downstairs at the start of another day. Oh, oh. oh, I'm so tired. Must be dreadfully early. What does the clock say? Ten o'clock? Ten o'clock? It can't be. That's the first stroke. It will be nine fifty-nine and forty seconds. Um, excuse me, are you sure? At the first stroke, it will be 9.59 and 50 seconds. I I'm sorry, madam, I think you must be mistaken. At the first stroke, it will be 10 o'clock precisely. Look, I, I don't want to argue with you, madam, but I'd advise you to check your watch. Matter, Good morning, my lord. No, nothing. It's, it's just they're, they're all at sixes and sevens at the telephone exchange. Well, who, who are you speaking to? The lady who tells the time, Miss Tim. Oh, <laughs> that's the speaking clock. It's a record, oh, Newt. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. I'm sorry, I'm so tired. I'm not properly awake. Um, have you had breakfast yet? Breakfast? Haven't you had breakfast yet? No, my lord, have you? Of course. I've just come back from Matins. Good Lord, then it really is ten o'clock. Of course it is, and I'm surprised it's not eleven, judging by the length of the anthem. Anthem? That's the fourth anthem the choir has sung this week. Yes, and incidentally, by far the most boring note. Then the Dean really is going ahead with his plan to put the cathedral on the map musically. Yes, Newt. It seems we may regret his going to preach at King's College, Cambridge, last week almost as much as they must have done. <laughs> Their music must have impressed him very much. A little bit too much, if you ask me. Still, the choir school breaks up today, and while the boys are on holiday, we can look forward to four weeks without anthems. Now, have you opened the post? Yes, my lord. <sighs> Newt, how dare you yawn like that in my face? Oh, I, I'm so sorry, my lord. I, it's the central heating. Indeed? Uh, what, pray, is wrong with my new central heating? Well, nothing, my lord, nothing. It's just, it's, it, it's rather hot. Heating, Newt, is meant to be hot. I know, my lord, but was it necessary to screw up all the windows? No, I thought I had explained to you that we cannot install expensive central heating and then start opening all the windows. Yes, my lord, you did, but, but my room is directly over the boiler. Oh, oh, is it, Newt? Oh, poor old Newt, yes, I, I hadn't really realised that. Yes, and it's got the hot tank actually in it. Ah, then you certainly mustn't open the window. We can't let the hot tank get cold, can oh. we? <laughs> now, where's the mail? Here's one. It's from the Reverend Percival Stott at Badgeworth. Oh, oh, Stott. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing you lead us at the hymn service tomorrow. Oh, bless his old heart. Is it the hymn service tomorrow, my lord? Well, of course it is, Newt. You know, we always hold it the day after the boys go home. Oh, dear. Do you think the Archdeacon will insist on singing a solo of Armoured Christian Soldiers again this year? Oh, I do hope not, Newt. You know, Henry never seems to realise his voice is definitely an acquired taste. Bishop! Bishop! Ah, morning, Henry, dear old thing. What's the matter? It's the Dean, Bishop. Well, what about him? Oh, he's on the roof. On the roof? Which roof? The uh, choir school roof, Archdeacon. Yes, he's standing right on the edge. Ah, that'll be something to do with the retiling, won't it, my lord? Oh, yes, of course. They hmm. start today. He's probably supervising the workmen, Henry. Oh, then he isn't going to jump off. Uh, <laughs> jump off, Henry? Why should you imagine that he'd do that? Oh, just wishful thinking. 
<laughs> Never mind now, Henry. We've got the hymn service tomorrow. Oh, so we had, Bishop. Uh, what are we going to sing? There's always a bide with me. Fast falls the even tide. We can hardly sing that just before lunch. <laughs> no. Now, what would be suitable just before lunch? How about I hunger and I thirst? Oh. <laughs> See you, that is, will you, Nukes? Right, my lord. Ah, note. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Dean. Won't you come in? Thank you. The Dean, my lord. Ah, Dean. Well, my lord, what about matins, eh? What about it, Dean? The anthem, my lord. Rejoice! Oh, that. <laughs> well, surely you were impressed. Oh, well, yes. It was very nice, wasn't it, Henry? Yes, Bishop. Nice and long. <laughs> long? But the choir only sang the first part. Ooh. They will sing the anthem in its entirety tomorrow. Tomorrow? No, but they can't, Dean. They're going home. Yes, Dean. Surely you haven't forgotten. We have the annual hymn service tomorrow. There will be no hymn service tomorrow, my lord. No hymn service? What do you mean? We shall hold a music festival instead. Oh. I have arranged for the choir to stay on an extra day. But what about the roof of the choir school, Dean? Yes, I mean, haven't the men begun taking the tiles off? I'm having a tarpaulin put over it for the night. But what about the boys? Surely they're not going to be pleased at the prospect of staying on. I did not consult them, my lord. Their parents seem delighted. Oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but, Dean, those boys could catch pneumonia. I must tell you that I strongly disapprove of this arrangement. If you take my advice, you will cancel the music festival and send the boys home at once. May I remind you, my lord, that the choir is under my control? Precisely, Dean, and you have a duty to see that the boys are properly housed. Duh, this is nonsense. The boys are only to be there for one night. They will go home after the music festival tomorrow. What sort of musical festival is it going to be, Dean? A veritable feast, Archdeacon. A musical cornucopia worthy of Saint Cecilia herself. Not only will the choir sing all four parts of the anthem Rejoice, and Mr. Paddy Jones will delight us with an organ recital, but I have persuaded the two vicars choral to give us an exhibition of early Salmodic plain song. Oh, but Dean, the hymn service is an annual tradition. The hymn service may be all right in a parish church, but it is not sufficiently uplifting for a cathedral. Nonsense, Dean. What could be more uplifting than a great congregation singing together in unison? Perhaps I can best answer by quoting a remark made to me by the Dean of King's College, Cambridge, when I dined at High Table there recently. <laughs> he turned to me confidentially and remarked, Pew Critchley, please may I have a chair? Oh, weren't there enough to go round, Dean? No, no, no. May I have a chair? Oh, yes, yes, of course. No, no to chair. Oh, yes, yes of course. Uh, what, what, what's the matter, Dean? You know, yeah, well, he, it's rather warm in here. Not as, not as warm as my room, Dean. Do you know I've got the boiler underneath and the hot tank is right oh, beside... Oh, quack, quack, quack. Yeah. Uh, can, can we get you anything, Dean? Oh, thank you, no. No, my lord, if you would just open a window. Uh, oh, well, yes, yes. I'm afraid that's going to be rather difficult. Yes, you see, the bishop has screwed them up. <laughs> but, well, well, so as not to waste heat, Dean. But you can't do that. It's against the bylaws. Is it, Dean? Are you sure? Yes. Section 4C, subsection 29. It is forbidden to make alterations of a semi-permanent nature to existing ventilatory outlets. Oh. If you don't believe me, my lord, why not telephone the health department? Oh, what a good idea. Uh, Do you know the number? Uh, uh, 4211. Oh, thank you, Dean. Uh, I'll get through at once. Uh, Put down that phone note. But shouldn't we check, my lord? Certainly not. It's quite uh, unnecessary. Oh, good, good. You take my word for it and unscrew the windows. I will do no such thing. Have you any idea what a house this size costs to heat? No, my lord. At the deanery, our expenses do not include such luxuries. Oh, really? Well, if they did, Dean, I can assure you your windows would be screwed up as well. Yeah, and I can assure you, my lord, that nothing would persuade me to contravene a bylaw. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must go and see how the workmen are progressing on the roof. Ah, but, 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 Dean, we must discuss this musical festival first. Quite unnecessary, my lord. All arrangements are made. Just come along tomorrow morning and enjoy yourselves. <laughs> I'll show you out. Dean. Yes, thank you, Luke. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Oh, well, Henry, what do you say to that? Pity he didn't jump off the roof. Oh. <laughs> really, are 
father's ahead to walk in here and calmly tell us we can't have our hymn service. Mm, I was looking forward to a good thing. Yes, and so was I, Henry. For all the saints, we plough the fields and scatter, ye holy angels bright. Oh, we'd have had them all. And onward, Christian souls. Oh, well, yeah, yes, Henry, yes. I mean, we're all going to be disappointed, Henry. <laughs> yes. Including I... the choir boys. Hey, I feel so sorry for those boys. Yes, so do I, Henry. Fancy keeping them from their holidays and making them spend a the night under a tarp pawling in the middle of winter. Mm. They won't like it, Bishop. They won't, Henry, that's certain. My lord? Yes, Newt? Well, I've been thinking, and it seems to me the question resolves itself down to whether or not it's healthy to sleep like that. I shouldn't think it is for a moment. Oh, then don't you think we should ring the health department and check if it's against the bylaw? Newt, what a splendid idea! Get on the phone and check up at once, will you? Right, my lord, I will. The dean said we mustn't contravene the bylaws, didn't he, Henry? He did, Bishop. <laughs> Hello? Is that the health department? May I speak to the chief officer, please? Thank you. My lord, shall I ask if there's a specific bylaw against screwing up windows? Of course not, Loot. You will ask if there is a specific bylaw against choir boys sleeping under a tarpaulin in winter. Oh. <laughs> Say, don't you know? You get a splendid view of the choir school roof from your bedroom window, don't you? Can you see anything through those binoculars? Uh, no, my lord. The health inspector's still examining the tiles. <laughs> What's the dean doing? He's still talking to the health inspector, my lord. I'd like to know what he's saying, wouldn't you, Henry? Uh, Henry! Sorry, Bishop. What was that? Oh, Henry, aren't you interested in what's happening? Yes, Bishop. But it's so hot in here. <laughs> you don't have to sleep here, Archdeacon. When that boiler gets going at night, I can tell you it's quite something. Oh, do stop making a fuss, Newt. What's happening now? Um, nothing. Oh, oh, yes. The health inspector's shaking his head. Ah, I thought he would. Yes, and he started to climb down the ladder. Splendid. <coughs> what about the dean? He's following. He's still talking. Can you see his expression? No, but the health inspector's shaking his head again. Oh, that clinches it. Henry, we shall have our hymn service after all. What's happening now, Newt? Um, they're shaking hands. Ah, the health inspector's getting into his car. Yeah, he's driving off, and the dean is turning, and, uh... Oh, he's, uh, coming this way, my lord. Good. Well, we've seen all there is to see. Come on, let's get downstairs. Rather, Bishop. Ooh. Do you want to see the Dean's face, eh, Henry? <laughs> no, Bishop. I want to get out of this heat. <laughs> but, my Lord, um... What? Uh, supposing the Dean knows who phoned the health inspector, won't he be rather cross? I expect he will, Newt. Well, um, in that case, would you mind answering the door? Not in the least, Newt. It'll be a pleasure. <laughs> ah, Dean, do come in. Back again. Thank you, my Lord. Have you come to give us some more news about the musical festival? Yes, my lord. We've hit a snag. A snag, Dean. I wonder what it can be. Well, surely you know. Didn't you ring the health officer? Uh, me, Dean? Well, no. As a matter of fact, I didn't ring him. Then who did? Someone must have. Well, Dean, you see, it was like this. Ah, you rang him, did you not? Well, yes, Dean, I did. But uh, acting on orders... Then... Is, um, whom must I thank? Uh, thank? For preventing me breaking a bylaw. I'm most grateful. Oh, my dear Dean, I'm so glad you take it like this. I'm sure it's all for the best, you know. After all, as I said earlier, you do have a duty to see that the choir is properly housed. And uh, nice as it would be to have a musical festival, I'm sure you're much wiser to send those boys home. <laughs> I'm not sending them home. Uh, you're not? No. It has proved impossible to arrange it at such short notice. Mr. Paddy Jones assures me he would never hope to contact the parents, so we've been forced to find alternative accommodation. Oh, that won't be easy, dear. No, my lord, no, no. We need a large house. How about the deanery, Dean? <laughs> How kind of you to suggest it, Archdeacon. Oh, it was a pleasure. <laughs>
Unfortunately, when I told the health inspector of our heating arrangements, he seemed to think the boys would be not much better off than under the tarpaulin. Was he able to make any alternative suggestion, Dean? Yes, Newt, he has been most helpful. Where does he suggest they go, Dean? Here, my lord. Here? Oh, not in my palace? Yes, when I told him about your new central heating, he said we need look no further. Oh, did he? Well, Dean, I've got to think about this. Yes, I'm afraid there's no time for that. Ha, ha, that will be the advance party. I'll go and let them in. Oh, no, but Dean, I'm sorry. You really can't ask me to have all those boys here. I'm afraid I must, my lord. After all, as you said yourself, I do have a duty to see that the choir is properly housed. Mm. Ha, ha, come along in, boys. Come along in. boys. Watch the beat now. Oh, careful. Second time, what do you think you're doing? Now, careful. Think what you're singing about, boy. Your cocoa, my lord. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Newt. What's the time? Half past nine. Good. Gracious, how much longer have I got to sit out here in the hall listening to that row? They've been practicing in my study since tea time. I've got a great deal of work to do. Mm. All right, boys. Let's be all now. Quietly, quietly up the stairs to your rooms. I said quietly, boys. Ah, ah, Mr. Paddy Jones, you've finished the practice, have you? Yes, regrettably, I had to stop. The boys are utterly exhausted. Well, I must turn in. We have a long day tomorrow. To tomorrow? Does that mean you'll be wanting my study in the morning as well? Yes, uh, but not for long, Your Lordship. What, just a short practice, eh? Yes, only from uh, half past seven until ten o'clock. <laughs> Good night, gentlemen. Oh. Never mind, my lord. At least you've got your study for the rest of this evening. Yes, I suppose so, Luke. Come on, let's try and get a little bit of work done. Mm. Hey. <gasps> what? What have they done? Look, as though a bomb's hit it. Crikey, Moses. How dare they put all these music stands and stuff in here? They had to put it somewhere, my lord. Yeah, well, what about their rooms? Well, they're all full to bursting. Mm, well, that's their problem. I'm going upstairs to see Paddy Jones, and I'm going to tell him to get this stuff out of here at once. Hey. Who on earth can that be at this time of night? I'll just see, my lord. Oh, Dean. Hmm. No, everything under control? Yes, I think so, Dean. Oh. Good evening, Dean. Ah, there you are, my lord. Now, you know Mr. Fox and Mr. Dawson, the vicar's coral, don't you? Oh, yes, good evening, gentlemen. Mm. Good evening, my lord. I must say this is very kind. It certainly is. <laughs> what is kind? To put us up like this. <laughs> to do what? It seems the workmen have taken off more tiles than we had first realised, my lord. Yes, they've stripped our dormitory roof. Stripped it. Haven't they, Garth? They have, my lord. Stripped it bare. 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 <laughs> we, uh, we started to go to bed, didn't we? And I happened to look at the roof and I could see right up. Couldn't I, Garth? <laughs> yes, he saw right up. Yes. <laughs> I felt sure that you would wish to help, my lord. But there aren't any more rooms, Dean. They're all full of boys. I, I, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm afraid you'll have to go back and manage as best you can. Oh, but there's such a draft. Draft? He notices it straight away. We can't sleep with a draft. Oh, no, we don't, my lord. Our voices would never stand it. Never. No, never. never. We've got the Salmodic Plain Song tomorrow. The Dean did tell you that we've agreed to do the Salmodic Plain Song. Yes, yes, Mr Fox, indeed he did. It's not easy, you know. We've had to put in a lot of extra practice. Oh, yes, I'm sure you have. But I really can't help you. I'm afraid the palace is full. Uh, what are we going to do? I mean, it's not only the Salmodic Plain Song. No. no. Mr Dawson here is carrying the whole Alto line in rejoice. Won't you go off? Yes, the whole line, yes. Oh, I must take care of my voice. I must have a nice warm room. Really, I must. Well, my room's nice and warm. But don't you can't give up your room. Where will you sleep? Well, I could shake down on the sofa in your room. Oh, splendid, splendid. I knew you would come to the rescue. But it'll mean these gentlemen will have to share a room, Dean. Oh, we all share, don't we, Gar? <laughs> Yes, everything. <laughs> could we see the room? Yes, a splendid suggestion. Perhaps we could all go up and look at it. Will you lead the way, Newton? Oh, that is, if you have no objection, my lord. Oh, yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, I... Well, excellent, excellent. Now, come along, gentlemen. Come along. Come on, Garth. 
coming, Ronnie. <laughs> oh, we're so grateful for all the trouble you're taking for us, Mr. Dean. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Mr. Dawson. I bet it is. Here we are. This is my room. Oh, it's not very big, is it? No, but it's very warm. What do you think, Garth? Well, I'm not sure, Ronnie. <laughs> Why don't you go inside, gentlemen, and have a proper look? Oh, right ho, Mr. Dean. Excuse us, everyone. Shan't be a minute. What a happy solution, my lord. Yes, well, I'm glad you think so, Dean. Ah, mm. uh, ah, uh, Mr. Dean. Yeah, Mr. Fox. Well, what do you think? Uh, no good, I'm afraid. Oh, why? What's wrong? Isn't it warm enough? That's the trouble. It's too hot. But I thought you wanted a warm room. But not that warm. It's so drying. We never sing a note tomorrow. Oh, well, I'm afraid I can't be of any further help. You have no other rooms at all. <laughs> not unless you want to commandeer my room, Dean. Ah, I've forgotten your room, my lord. Where is it? The bishop's room. Oh, it's, it's here. Yes. Oh, it is nice, isn't it? Oh, yes. What a lovely room. Yes, that would suit you, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. Yes, we'd be all right in there, wouldn't we, Garth? Oh, yes, we'd be safe in there, my lord. Oh, would you? Uh, where do you suggest that I sleep? Couldn't you share my room, my lord? The perfect solution. <laughs> what right, gentlemen, in you go. Oh, Thank you, my lord. What a relief this is, Garth. Oh, it certainly is, Ronnie. Good night, everyone. Yes, good night. Good night, all. <laughs> well, I think I will say good night, too, my now, lord. Now, just one minute, Dean. I have a few words I wish to address to you. Sorry, my lord. I have no time. I have a great many preparations to make. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, this is an outrage. Never mind, my lord. At least it'll give you a chance to see what it's like sleeping next to the hot water tank, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> There you are, Newt. I must say, I'm ready to turn in. You know, I never realised until now just how nice your room is. Mm. Hey, what's this thing on the bed? Just a screwdriver, my lord. Well, I can see that. What's it for? In case you thought it'd be a good idea to unscrew the window. Uh, I see. Well, I don't think it's a good idea, Newt. Oh, right, my lord. I've uh, put these cushions on this chair to make it more comfortable. Good. Then you shouldn't have too bad a night. <laughs> me? Well, you don't expect me to go to sleep on it, do you? No, I suppose not, my lord. Did you have a good bath? I didn't have a bath. The choir boys have used all the hot water. You should have waited, my lord. It soon warms up. Oh, mm, does it? Mm. And I suppose it gets warm in here, too. Yes, my lord. Would you like to unscrew the window? Certainly not, Luke. Good night. Good night, my lord. <laughs> that is, haven't you forgotten something? Me? No, I don't think so. Oh. What were you thinking of? Nothing. Nothing, my lord. Good night. Good night, Newt. Hmm? Uh, Newt. Yes, my lord. Have you dropped something? Me, my lord. <laughs> well, what, what, no. are you, what are you doing down there on your knees? Saying my prayers. Uh, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. Don't, um, don't you say yours, my lord? Well, of course I do, Newt. Ah, yeah. In bed. <laughs> what on earth that noise? It um, it sounds like singing, my lord. At this time of night, who could it be? I think it must be the vicar's call. Oh, this is too much. Kindly be quiet. Good. That shut him up. Hello. Now what are they up to? <laughs> did you want something? Yes. Ah, yes, Mr. Fox, I did. I want you to stop making that noise. Noise? But we're only having a last little private rehearsal for tomorrow, Your Lordship. Yes, but we're trying to sleep, Mr. Fox. Oh. Then why don't you get off that chair and go to bed? I am in bed. <laughs> this is where I'm sleeping. It takes all sorts, doesn't it? <laughs> Good night, both. Good night, Mr. Fox. Oh, now perhaps we'll get some peace. Turn the light off, Newt. Very well, my lord. I'm just going to have a bath, Garth. Right here, Ronnie. My lord, it always happens when someone draws off the hot water. Oh, does it? Put the light on, Newt. 
What's up? Where are you going? To the bathroom, Newt. I'm going to put a stop to this. Mr. Fox? Mr. Fox? Yes, what is it? Mr. Fox, I'm sorry, but you can't have a bath at this time of night. But I always have a bath. It relaxes my vocal cords. Oh, well, just for tonight, I'm afraid you'll have to do without. Oh, if I go flat in the middle of Rejoice tomorrow, I hope everyone will realise it isn't my fault. There is no need to be rude. Rude? <laughs> That's rich. <laughs> now, let us have some peace and quiet. Turn the light off. Right, my lord. Good night. Good night. What? 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 Where's him? What's that, my lord? What? Where am I? Where am I? In my oh. my room, my lord. Oh, Newt! What's oh, the matter? I was it... dreaming, Newt. Was it a bad dream, my lord? Yes, Newt. I dreamt that I just died. <gasps> How wonderful! <laughs> did you did you see Saint Peter? No, Newt. Oh. I saw something quite different. <laughs> oh, oh, I am hot. That's, that's the tank, my lord. It's boiling. Well, how long does it go on boiling? Until you have your shave at seven. God, what's the time now? Three o'clock. <laughs> Another four hours. I can't stand this. Where's that screwdriver? What are you going to do? Unscrew that window, of course. But you can't. Why not? Because it's a matter of principle. Who said so? You did. Oh, well, I must have been talking nonsense. But you weren't, my lord. You weren't. You really meant it. Look, Newt, you've been pestering me for days to unscrew this window, and now, when I want to, you try to stop me. What's the matter with you? Well, I can't let you go against your principles, my lord. Stuff and nonsense, Newt. Give me that screwdriver. I won't. Look, 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 look. If I promise not to unscrew the window, Will you give me that screwdriver? Yes, if you promise, my lord. I promise not to unscrew the window. Here you are, my lord. Thank you, Newt. <laughs> ah, that's done it, I think. Oh, good morning, Newt. It looks as though we're first down. Yes, my lord. Oh, what a dreadful night. Oh, look, my lord. What, Newt? The study. Well, what about it? Hey, good heavens, they've tidied it up. The dean must have made them. Yes, but when, if we're the first people down? Well, perhaps we aren't, my lord. What's the time? Well, it's a... Eleven o'clock, it can't be. The music festival is in a quarter of an hour. Oh, morning, gentlemen. So you've woken up at last. Uh, good morning, Mr. Paddy Jones. We had a very disturbed night. So we heard, Your Lordship. Where are the boys? On the train. The train? We've packed them off home. But what about the music festival? It's cancelled. The boys lost their voices. It was pathetic. I started the practice at half past seven this morning, and all they could do was croak. But why? Your central heating, my lord. No. Where the window's screwed up, it's very drying, you know. If you'll pardon me saying so, I think it's unhealthy. Oh, so do I, Mr. Parry Jones. Well, I must rush. I promised to drive the vicar's coral to the doctor's. Oh, whatever for? They've lost their voices, too. Oh, is that the central heating as well? I'm not sure. Mr. Fox seems to think it's caused by his not being allowed to have a bath last night. <laughs> He's very upset. Yeah, I bet he is. Bishop, Bishop. Oh, Good morning, Mr. Archdeacon. Good morning. I see you later, my lord. Good uh, morning. Bishop, have you heard the news? Yes, Henry, it's off. Uh, no, 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 it isn't. Not the hymn service. Of course, Henry, I'd forgotten about the hymn service. Do you hear that? We're going to have our hymn service after all. Oh, yes, my lord. Look, we, we, we've only got ten minutes. Come on, we must run. No, 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 no. no. We can't go yet. We haven't chosen the hymns. Uh, don't worry, Bishop. It's all arranged. Uh, Henry, you don't say you've chosen them. Yes, Bishop. And guess what we're starting with? Henry, Henry, no, 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 Henry, you're not going uh, to see. Archdeacon, not armoured Christian soldiers. Yes, Bishop, my solo. Come on. Oh, Henry. <laughs> In that episode of All Gas and Gators, the parts were played as follows. The Archdeacon, Robertson Hare, the Bishop, William Mervyn, the Dean, John Barron. The Chaplain, Jonathan Cecil, Mr. Fox, Hugh Paddock, 
Mr. Dawson, Frank Williams, Mr. Paddy Jones, Dudley Jones. The Bishop Warms Up was written for television and adapted for radio by Pauline Devaney and Edwin Apps. The programme was produced by John Dias.